Yes, she's the What's the applicant's name? Uh, 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 I'm just, if he wants to go in the meeting now and make sure it's right. Energy committee. Because I've started the meeting. Yep. I mean, not on Zoom. Kristen? You have a lot of questions. We're more worried about that. Exactly. No, I asked. No, it was, was it Ken I had it? No, it was John. Well, that's actually, that's actually one of our first. It was big, too. You know, I don't know what's that new What? Well, before I, before I we sure made an know. ordinance change, uh, amendments did not require a public hearing. It was just went right to a council vote. Now, just to test it on contract yeah. signs. Only applications require hearing first. Oh, so we did that. Good. Really official act. Yeah, it's, uh, have you had a good. chance to talk to Frank? Well, you'll, you'll be remembered. Uh, uh, <laughs> We're a negative nanosecond, <laughs> you know, in the black hole. <laughs> With all the rights and privileges pertaining there, too. <laughs> Yeah, this guy. Uh, mm -hmm. Mayor. Holy cow, can I? got the bundles of riches this year. With the high yeah. 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 Senator, just they're always just barely. Yeah, scraping by. I think I think I think Ben Mayola tried to me. How are you doing? I just want you to know, do not spend my idle hours looking for threads to pull and stuff, but yeah. Yeah. I got you to the review. Yeah. Yeah, do you have yeah, she called and we talked we talked about it. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. yeah, you know, we lost the trail on that. Hey, do you guys want to join the Zoom meeting now and practice sharing? Just make sure you have it. I have yeah. it yeah. in New York. Is it, is, I get the roadway I Did it, did it start on its own or because I, I. Because there was a dispute over that's not the screen I left. roadway in addition to screen. Right, we're behind it. Anyway, we'll, we'll probably get things back. Good. Yeah, but thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Good. Great. Burlington, Vermont. They have. You're Dan, how are you too? Channel Mike. I am Dan. Awesome. Uh, so a lot of the water is being in these pools. Yep. You want to turn your laptop off? You want to turn your mic off because you're going to be speaking to the mic in front of your client there. So. Okay, my mic is on mute. I've been here for a while. That's good. That's good. That's good. Yeah. You'll never know you're on here. No, but it says it's on mute. <laughs> you know, he's good. His laptop's on mute. That's right. We should be hearing nice to see you. Nice to see you. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and then <laughs> content, you've given me permission to share. I had to put, I had to put pants on to make this. I'm just gonna. Yeah, I didn't have to. Right. <laughs> <laughs> he was at home and appreciated. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You're good. Yeah. 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 So you can see it. You'll see the same thing. Into the mountains and into the Morocco. One more time with the dogs. Where do you go? What's that? Going up by the Wild River. You know where that is off 113? I don't know where that is. What's the closest town? Uh, Freiburg on the south end. Yeah. And uh, Bethel on the north end. It's a road. It's a road that they gate. After November, no, just who, who's le, who, who owns the land? Is it a paper company? It's, no, it's all na white national forest. There's four wow. campgrounds. Yeah, and, 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 yeah, and we've done all three. We're doing the one that we haven't done last year, and I like it because yeah, and, and, there's no power. There's all there is is pump water, no cell phones, no nothing. nothing. You can't. You couldn't so. get. <laughs> That's the danger part when we go hiking. We're very you, you, you careful. You know, you just slide the I'm thing. Out there and we're not, no, not, not yet. Not until we're. Should we, should we bring up our initial image? Yeah, and we went 
Because we've gone once a month since June. So when we went in August, yes. Yes. we got So this is say that. Uh, I'm glad I got an 85 pound dog. <laughs> you kept me warm awesome. and I kept him warm. When you say we, it's you and your dog. Your Just wife, me and the dog. Your wife doesn't. No, it's not allowed. <laughs> that was in the marriage vows. <laughs> right? That's right. Um, you know, well, I'm going to say these things as part of you know, the, the dealership requirements requires we upgrade our properties every 10 years. That time has come, and these are the things they're asking us to do. We feel we better serve our clients. And, and then we have the, those before and after shots, you know. What? But you know, it's a good little magazine. Yeah, yeah but we're going back to 05, kind of. Well, we put the building. I like this one with the doodle on it. And it really hasn't been really changed. And so you have the same tile you did when we first started, because we were kind of like cross. We were both before on the cusp of Little House One. And then for years, I think they've been chasing you around for two. And now they finally got you. So we need to start by tax over there? Well, when they're, when they're ready for us. Evening. You know, I wish I had stock in plexiglass before all this madness started. I've been doing very, very well. Yeah. I didn't bring my headphones. I have no idea. I have no idea. I, I don't. I find it hard to believe this will be controversial. But. Oh, okay. So we, uh, we built the building in 2005. 2005, 2000. Yeah. <coughs> 15 years, imagine that. Yeah, I know. That's kind of my introduction to I was thinking that this morning. Yeah, you know, and then you're kind of going, oh, man. I was thinking about the old guy. I'm like, oh, he was good to me. I was here in 2005. Yeah. 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 No, I benefited greatly from knowing this guy. Who was the guy from Mr. Bagel back then? Tim Conway, I think. No, it wasn't him. No. It wasn't Tim. Was, uh, uh, he did the shows for the last two, right? Oh, 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 oh. Nice show. Yeah. They found they let him go. Oh, oh, Tom, uh, Perry. What? Jeff Perry. Yeah, good guy. Yeah, Jeff is a not really nice guy. Where is he now? I'm not sure. He's done a bunch of different things. Nice like he was guy. doing some appraising stuff, but I haven't, I haven't, uh, we kept in touch for a while. And, um, hmm. I should contact him, because he's, he's a really pleasant guy. He just lives, he doesn't live very far from me. Oh, he doesn't, okay. He's a good sport. He's a good sport. <coughs> We've been working with a uh, uh, Mercedes Benz now for what, two years? We've been what? Working with Mercedes Benz for two years. Yeah. It's just a two year process. Two year process. So. Have we been working with a town the whole time? No, we kind of came to them in January. Yeah. And that's when we showed them the, the all glass box, which we we knew and they told us next. So I don't know how much history uh, Jay will share. Uh, he's, he's pretty thorough. Jim, I spent last summer under the camp wearing an N90, you know, doing because the, the other side is it's kind of a dust dirt. And, you know, I got used to it. I have not been able to get used to these damn things. They try me crazy. You still have to say, this is stuff saving really well forever. Yeah it's, not, yeah, it's not the kind of stuff you want to be reading. Was Peter going to make it tonight? Or as far as you know? Yeah. I just put mine up and put it in the trash. <coughs> yeah. Right. Mill's beautifully, though. 
and I pocket screw my joints together. You should see. So I have this pocket screwer. It's like a machine. Oh, it's like oh yeah, it's cool. hundred bucks. Yeah. So what I do is I lay out the strips and then I pocket screw them at forty-five, flip them over, glue them, and they're they're ready to go because the pocket screws are so strong immediately that uh, you know the glue helps too. But yeah. I have way the screws were like the film position. You put the plug in. Yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. This process in here yet? Have you been through this process? <coughs> no, I have not. This is my first. <coughs> but uh, our IT guy today took me through it. It's not too painful. No, true. The new skills you need to have. Yeah, yeah. Turn the camera on, but that's the trouble with our camera being on. I won't see you. Well, actually, I could see you. There's you. Oh, Jean Marie's up there. Yeah. So, here's the edge. Here's the edge. Just yeah. You know, it's just. The area that we're looking to increase. Yeah? I'll show you what's in the area. And then this is an aerial of the existing building. This is, this is, let's go, this is what it would look like mm -hmm. for the renovations we're yeah. asking for, or the permissions we're asking for. Right, another view of the building. Again, the renovations we're asking for. Just for everybody in the room, I'm going live on YouTube now. Just. Okay, so I'm gonna... uh, well, no, I don't know if we should brought to uh, Let's wait for them to ask us to start our presentation. Yep, we're good. Okay, good evening, everybody. This is the Wednesday, September 2nd, 2020, 6 p.m. Uh, joint public hearing between the Town Council and the Planning Board. Uh, item number one is a call to order, which I have just did. Uh, item number two is roll call, which I think, Jay, are you making the roll call today? Yes, I've been asked to take that role, so okay. I'll start with council members in the room, and I'll move to Zoom. Uh, Councilor Cloutier? Here. Uh, Chair Johnson? Here. Councillor Hamill? Here. Councillor Johnson? Here. Councillor Hayes? Councillor Hayes is muted currently. I'll come back there. Uh, Councillor Katarina? Jay, is your mic on? I have the light on, yes. Mm, I don't, I feel like Zoom. Peter, can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me? You know why? It's because my mic's muted. There we go. <laughs> Let's try that again. Peter, can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me? Okay. My apologies. Uh, we're in the middle of roll call. Jay? Yep. Uh, let's see. Councillor Hayes? I think I heard a uh, uh, faint here. Uh, Councillor Katarina? We'll Excellent. Uh, now to board members, uh, Ms. Henderson? Here. Next Mr. Bealy? Here. Mr. McGee? Here. Uh, Mr. Meinking? Here. Uh, who I have up there? Uh, Ms. Saunders? Here. Okay. There is a little bit of an echo, uh, so if you are in Zoom and not talking, can you guys just mute yourself just to make sure? I don't know where the echo is coming from. So I'm just... Right you got to change this. We can't hear for some reason. We can't hear. Sure, 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 sure. Okay. So is there a way? I can turn the microphone off. No. Yeah. On the microphones off. Okay. Is there a way? You're going to hear it through chambers. Yes, I just haven't been so far. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Jean Marie or Peter, can you just say something real quick, just to make sure we're all set? Their audio yeah. is low. 
everybody just bear with us. I'm trying to get the audio up for the Zoom folks. We can't hear you, so I'm just. Oh, oh your speakers are muted on the laptop. What's that? Uh, Jean Maria Peter, can you try it one more time? Peter, can you say something? Uh, Peter, can you just keep talking by any chance? <laughs> Poor Peter. <laughs> it's very you should ask Jean Marie to keep talking. It would have been more in her nature. <laughs> No, you're going to get a sharp rebuttal from that. <laughs> She'll get me back when it counts. <laughs> Maybe you guys should all get on Zoom. You got it. We're good, Jean Marie. It worked. Your, your special sauce worked. We're good. Okay. I was reciting Shakespeare. Very impressive. <laughs> All right. For those of you watching at home, we apologize. Uh, we are on to item number three, which is a public hearing with the planning board and the town council on a proposed contract zone request from, uh, from, from to discuss the proposed amendment proposed by Prime Mercedes Benz on the proper, property located at 137 U.S. Route 1 in Scarborough. Uh, before I do turn it over to the applicant, I'm just going to quickly read the process for tonight so everybody at home and ourselves are clear. The first uh, step that we're going to do this evening is there'll be a presentation by the applicant. The second step will be comments from town staff, which would be, I, I assume, Jay from planning. The third would be comments from members of the public. The fourth would be a response or a rebuttal from the applicant from any members of the public. The fifth is a discussion amongst members of the planning board and the town council, which may include questions posed to the applicant staff and the public. The six, excuse me, are comments from the members of the planning board concerning the land use implications of the proposed contract zone amendment. And finally, there's a preliminary discussion, preliminary town council discussion of the contract zoning amendment that's being requested. So that's the outline for this evening. I'm going to follow it as strictly as possible. So with that, I am going to turn this over to Mr. David Richards, is going to give us a presentation on behalf of the applicant. Uh, well, uh, uh, he said that you were Okay, we well, anyway. Yeah. Um, all, uh, all construction that happens at this site is subject to a contract zone. Um, we're here because at, periodically the manufacturers require uh, that the dealerships do things to stay inside of their franchise requirements. This time they've asked us to modify the client uh, lounge area. It's a bit, if any of you have a Mercedes, you notice it. it's a little tight in there. So, and then they've asked us to do some updating of the facade which is essentially adding a little more glass than we have there now. There's some black columns as opposed to blue. Everything's black now instead of blue. There's a lot of interior renovations. They've also asked us to present the blade wall, uh, which will be clear in the drawings in a moment. But essentially, we're asking to increase the uh, size of the building by 350 square feet beyond what we're presently have you know, allowed via the contract zone. So, um, so, so um, which is essentially this area right here is, right now the building is in the blue. The uh, area we're asking for is in the orange. Um, and the yellow is what's been pre-approved prior, you know, via other contract zones, you know, the, that we have uh, received. Um, I'm going to flip over to this is 
what the building looks like now. And I'm going to show you three different views of the existing building and then what it would look like um, if we are allowed to go forward. So, so this is the, the addition. Um, zoom in on the addition. The blade wall, the entrances are being uh, modified. And then again, the existing view, what it is now. That area, as you can see, is a little cramped compared to what it would be if we build out. Again, and then so, and then I'm going to show you a couple of street shots. This is going down Route One, <clears throat> and we can go back and revisit any of these as as that if that would be helpful. I should speak from there. Yeah. I speak from there. So. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, my name is uh, Dan Doucet. I'm the uh, general manager there. I, I've been there since uh, we built that building back in 2005, and, and this is our fourth visit. Uh, this, this is coming uh, from Mercedes-Benz because it's time, time to uh, refresh and upgrade not only the exterior, but we're also doing the interior too. Uh, uh, no real structural changes, but uh, uh, we are change out the tile, we change out all the hardwood, or, uh, uh, just uh, all the carpet. It's about, I think it's probably about a $1.52 million uh, refresh of the building. Uh, uh, and uh, 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 so the building footprint, uh, we're only looking to increase about 350 square feet, as uh, David said. Uh, uh, we have been in negotiation with uh, Mercedes Benz because their, their, their design calls, calls for a flat roof. And uh, we were able to uh, negotiate with them the colonial style roof to maintain that, because we know how important that is to the town. Uh, so uh, uh, I think the big contention here is probably the, the blade wall, uh, as they're asking for. And uh, I mean, uh, yeah. I, th I think that's probably the major thing here. Yeah. We, we started in January and met with Mr. Chase, showed them the unvarnished request by Mercedes, which was essentially tearing the roof off of this building, which, and putting a flat roof in to meet their prototype, would have been inordinately expensive and disruptive, and, and also uh, against you know, the, the design guidelines, which favors sloped roofs, which that's why there's a sloped roof on this building in the first place. Um, commercial buildings do better with flat roofs, so they, so, but. This has a slope roof. We're maintaining that, um, and then I have another slide here to just give you a sense of the materials. We're staying essentially with the same materials, except we are adding more glass to the showroom per their request. The columns are now black, the same columns that are blue, um, just like the tile is dark now and it'll be light. Go figure. Um, it is what it is. Um, the, we maintain the, uh, we, they would prefer we had ACM. We're going to maintain the EFAS so all of the exterior materials are essentially the same, uh, except with the addition of some more columns uh, and then, you know, the relocation of uh, this, is what they call the portal. Um, some other views. And then these are. That is kind of that detail where the column, and they're asking us to add this decorative steel. Right, and that decorative uh, field already exists on the north side of the building. That was approved uh, back in 2000. And, when we did the smart car, yes. When we did the smart car, right. Yeah. And we no longer have the smart car franchise, so uh, at some point that sign will be coming down because the smart car is no longer imported into this country. That's about it. Um, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's not, I, I don't think it's a, a, a large request. It's fairly simple, but the process requires that we get permission. So, um, any questions or? I think we'll hold off on questions until, okay. until to, the, to the staff that we are supposed to ask questions. But thank you. That's.
pretty straightforward and we appreciate it. Mr. Chase, uh, you want to lead off comments from town staff? Sure. Um, hopefully you all have received uh, staff's comments or memo dated August 27th on this request. As was just indicated by the applicant, really it's a, a pretty small change to the building, but it's a change nonetheless that requires this contract zone re uh, process, amendment process. So with that, I had an opportunity or a requirement to review the application for completeness, which we have completed. And that's why it's before you tonight. Just do want to mention that we did um, as, as uh, allowed in ordinance, we've waived the requirement for site inventory because the area that they're looking to develop is already developed, so it seemed um, unnecessary. So that was um, following the, the, the ordinance guidelines. We did that. Um, and really, th there's really just um, from a design perspective, obviously the planning board will do their due diligence at, when for site plan review. But when, where this is a contract zone and the contract zone does allow for an applicant to have a discussion with council about doing things maybe outside of the, the typical expectations, I did want to flag the, um, the blade wall that was already discussed and how that doesn't meet um, sort of a, a host of our design, uh, commercial design standards and expectations that are um, a part of our ordinance. So I thought that would be good to just flesh out and really get a good sense of where we are and that will help indicate or inform the planning board site plan review process. Um, so really from a, from a design land use perspective, that was really all I had at this point. And then the other item I flagged is just a reminder for council that sort of at the end of this discussion tonight, you will take a, a non-binding vote that will inform the applicant of you know, how they should proceed. Um, and it may be helpful in, you know, this is, one of the things that with recent contract zones that we've talked with this council quite a bit about is sort of public benefit and consistency. Um, you know, I think this one might be a little bit of a different animal because it is such a small um, increase that really do look to council as to what is it, you know, the applicants provided their responses and I think it might be good just to sort of give a tip of the hat or a general discussion if they're heading in the right direction or if there might be more expected or not um, down the road. That was really all I had. Thanks, Jay. Uh, number three is comments from the members of the public. So I'll pause real quick to see if there's anybody on the Zoom meeting that is looking to make comments about this. I don't believe there is. Item four is response or rebuttal from the applicant. So we're going to skip that because as no response or rebuttal is necessary. And next item is discussion amongst members of the planning board and the town council, which may include questions posed to the applicant, staff, and the public. So with that, uh, do we, this is where I'll open this up to the applicant. Any members of the town council or the planning board have any questions for the applicant? Well, oh, thanks, Jim Mary. Yep, go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I, I absolutely understand the expanded customer area as a public benefit given COVID and whatever. Um, yeah, you want to be able to have enough room for people to be comfortable, um, seated, waiting for service and whatnot. Uh, frankly, I will be absolutely uh, honest with you that I think that black, whatever the heck it is, is ugly. Um, and as, as Jay mentioned, it doesn't meet the, you know, our standards uh and i it's trendy it's one of those trendy things um and i don't get it and i i really would prefer not to see that so that's where i'm going at this point mr hamill yeah i i had a question that had to do with uh you know this is not the first contract zone amendment i guess this is the fourth right so i was wondering if you could give us a little background on that the applicant number one and then on maybe the planning board also could give us an idea of what bearing that could have or might have on on our consideration uh i, I believe this is a this would be our third our third amendment this is this is the fourth. Was the, fourth the, the initial to do the building. Oh, initial to do the building. The yes, smart edition, yeah. yeah. the sprinter right. edition, yeah. and yeah. then this. Yeah, I, uh, I, I didn't count the first one. Yeah, yeah. so when we initially did, initially did the building back in 2005, 2006, uh, and then uh, we uh, added on to the showroom in 2011, 2012, I think. Maybe? I think so. Yeah. 
Uh, and then about four years ago, uh, uh, we added on to the, we added our, our four bays and the car wash onto the service drive. And at that point, we bought the Sunoco station uh, uh, and we tore that down and uh, we, we added to the parking area. So if anybody remembers, there used to be a Sunoco station on the south side of the lot. <coughs> And uh, we purchased that and, uh, and, and tore that down. So those were the, uh, those were the changes. Yeah. Thanks for that. So the, what, the thing I'm after here is I was sort of doing the math on the square footage. And I also read in the materials that this is considered fully developed, this parcel, uh, already even before the, you know, this amendment, if I understand it correctly. So can you give us an idea of how, how much, you know, the you know, what, what percentage increase there's been in terms of this, you know, the com total square footage across the four amendments, if you were to include this one, and if that, you know, has any bearing again on uh, how the board might look at it and how we might sure. look at it. Yeah, yeah uh, that, that's a square footage of the Yeah, I, I, wait, that's the... Jay, do you, do you have... I'm just... You, you're throwing that at anybody, Don, I assume, right? Could, yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm scrolling through. So the, the original contract zone amendment, I believe I'm looking at. Yes. No, the, this is the original contract zone um, allowed up to a 24,000 square foot building. And so this will bring it up to, I, I, I'm not recalling off the top of my head. Uh, yeah, I'm just scrolling. So this will bring it up to around 27, 27 250, 250 is what Tom just said. So we're adding about yes. over time an increase yeah. of 3,000. And sort of there's been subsequent yeah. additions. We can walk through that if you want, but yeah. that's the start and stop, if you will. <laughs> yeah. uh, we, we weren't personally looking to, to increase the size of the footprint. It was Mercedes Benz. Uh, a design team that realized we need to expand the waiting room. Yeah, the, the, this process started with updating the in, interior of the building. We sent design drawings to Mercedes and they came back and said, we want the flat roof, we want all of these things, which started conversations with the town and so that Mercedes we had long discussions with Mercedes because they were putting their feet down saying, we're getting a flat roof and they're saying, the town won't let us do this. This is just the way it is. It's not only that we can't have a flat roof, but Land Rover doesn't have a flat roof. Volvo doesn't have a flat roof. There is a precedent in town. And so they finally acquiesced and we, we moved on. And then they came back to us with the addition and some modifications to the interior, which we were actually in agreement. We think it makes it, it, it a better yeah, customer it's, experience. Yeah, it's, it's time. It's time. It's getting old. Yeah, it, it, a better customer experience. Um, and they did add the blade wall. They have those on all of their new dealerships. They're a little more artful because the new dealerships are all rectangles. And to put this at a 45-degree angle, which again was we were shared this design and asked to present it. So, so just one one final thing, and I'm I'm not if there's not an answer to this, that's fine. But the thing that I'm trying to get at is there a limit in terms of when we said enough? You know, you've had enough. You know, it's a fully developed parcel. Uh, you know, how much more square footage could be expanded? You know, um, you know, does that go on indefinitely? Is there any limit to that, or is it? I understand all the reasons. Sure. Yeah. Why you're making the changes and what you're required to do in terms of yeah. complying as a as a dealer, you know, from a corporate standpoint, I understand all that. But yeah. it's like, so when when this is a, you know, it's a, a lot that's been developed and continues to be developed. You know, does is this indefinite or is there a point where we say no, the time you know the buzzer goes off. You know, you've hit a limit. So I guess you know from I, I think one of the things you're reacting to or, or talking about is in my memo where I talked about the fully developed site. And really what I was referring to there is the area where the building expansion is going is already paved area. Um, yeah. It's not, you know, um, a backfield, say, or something like that. That that was really that reference. Mm -hmm. In terms of how much development is allowed, our zoning ordinance does have sort of uh, minimum and maximum impervious coverage, um, building size permitted uses, quite frankly. And so really, that's what this contract zone, is there a limit? Not necessarily. Um, I, I think that will always be part of any review process. Um, 
So, so since it's commercial, it's got a different set of rules. It's not like I, you know, they have to comply with uh, no more than 25% footprint in a residential lot, that sort of thing. Well, there is, in, so in the TVC, uh, we're in the TVC zone. There is an impervious coverage um, uh, requirement, which I don't believe they've hit the threshold of, because really where they are building is already impervious coverage. So whether it's whether it's building or parking lot, that doesn't really matter for in terms of impervious coverage. Um, so I'd say we're not really butting up against that. Um, I think what we're really butting up against is that when this was originally approved, this use isn't an allowed use type in the TVC zone, nor was it an allowed use type in the B2, which it was originally back in 05 or whatever the time frame. Um, so I think at that point, there was discussion with the applicant and council around, okay, we're going to allow this, this use that other, otherwise wouldn't be permitted. How big are we going to allow it to go? And then with each subsequent discussion, there's been that same sort of... Okay. So to your question, you know, there, there is no potential to the end other than council ultimately saying we appreciate your request, but we don't think you're meeting our standards. That, that's, okay. Thank that you. Helps. Thanks very much. Thanks. Yeah. And uh, the other thing I want to mention is that uh, 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 during the initial build, the lot was you know, one size, and then we purchased the... Uh, the snorkel station, which improved, which increased the footprint of the whole uh, development. Yeah, yeah you were 24,000 square feet without Sunoco. Right. Correct. Right. Right. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and, and by putting the wash bay on the end of the building, that makes adding to the building problematic. Okay. At least from a, at least from a use yeah. standpoint. Nick, are you following up on this thread? I am. Okay, okay so <coughs> Nick and then Mr. Johnson. Yep. Uh, you quickly refer to L100 on your sheet. On the top left, they actually have the TVC zone Hulk and uh, space standards. Uh, and it looks to me, just to kind of get back to your question, uh, Don, Mr. Mr. Hamill, is that max building lot coverage, uh, they're proposed as 11, and the max is 50%. So right there will kind of give you the idea of where they are if they were typical um, of something that we would consider. And right below it is the impervious lot coverage as well. So you can see the percentages there, where they are, where they could be in theory. Thank you. Thanks. We're going to go with uh, Mr. Johnson and then Mr. Hayes, I believe, has a question. Yeah, my question is to uh, Jay, please, Jay. If this was not a contract zone and uh, commercial, it, it was sitting there not under a com uh, contract zone and the applicant wished to make these changes, would they still have to come in front of the planning board? Yes, because it would be an increase to the... Um, okay. Yeah. So, uh, as you're stating, the key elements here from your department is the... Uh, the blade wall is discouraged, uh, you know, in the town's commercial design standards, and black is not necessarily uh, the ideal color for the facade. So if this was not a contract zone and they had come for you, w w what would your position be? Because I, 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 I see your statement here, I just don't see what your position. What would your position be if this was not a contract zone? Typically, as staff, we try to provide what the ordinance says and allow the planning board to make their own determination. We don't typically make a recommendation because um, that's not our job. It's the job of the board who sits in judgment of the application. So typically, our, our comments to the planning board will look very similar to that. Um, when this does come before the planning board, we'll go through all the site plan review criteria, and the planning board will sort of do their due diligence in that regards. Um, this memo is really just intended to flag quickly those items that we thought, okay, here's something yep. that's outside of what the planning board would typically permit, um, and so, or our ordinances, I should say, would yep. permit, and so it should be flagged. Um, okay, thank you. Yep. Mr. Hayes? Peter, you're on mute. Yeah, this is kind of building on Councillor Johnson's question. So I understand that the, the blade wall, the so-called blade wall that's black, is outside sort of the parameters. What would make it conform to the parameters? I mean, is, is there, is there a, I guess I'd, bet, I'd like to better understand why it's outside the parameters. And is there some other way that would be inside the parameters that could still accomplish what the Mercedes I guess, wants to be able to project in that space. Jay, you want to answer that? or I, I can attempt to. Um, yep. So essentially what our, um, as was sort of noted in the, in the memo, our design standards have 
there's a number of areas that sort of speak to um, ensuring that uh, I can read a few of them. One that talks about additions shall be complementary to existing structures um, in terms of materials, uh, format, and detailing. That's from the architectural chapter. Um, we have buildings that are stylized to the point where structure uh, is of a form of advertising are not acceptable. Um, highly visible, compatible um, buildings. Uh, I can't quite read the <laughs> my my uh, writing on that one. Um, so there's just there's a few places that it's not compatible. I will say as part of the planning board review process, so design standards are, are elements that the planning board actually does have the ability to waive. Um, but it felt like where this is a contract zone, rather than that falling at the lap of the planning board to make the decision, it'd be helpful to understand um, what the, the board's feeling was. And I should also say, Peter, there is a, a section that in the um, uh, design standards that talk about components of a building shouldn't be black. Just a blanket, pretty clear statement about the color. Um, so as I said, there's, a, there's just a number of sort of areas in there. Um, and then, so the question as to what would make it compatible, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I, you know, Typically, it's upon the applicant to propose and the planning board to depose, if you will, sort of be sure that it meets the standard. So I, I'm not an architect. So I guess I know, you know, Dave does a lot of really good work in town. So I'm sure he would give it further thought if uh, Mercedes would allow him to. Sure. If I, uh, uh, if I, if I could speak just for a moment, and I'll turn it over to David, is that uh, the, uh, the new auto house design for Mercedes is that uh, the sign that we, the existing sign that we have out front, uh, the background goes to black, and that's the reason why the columns go to black. Every Mercedes Benz store in the whole country has black signs or black columns. As far as the blade goes, uh, I'm not a big fan of it either, uh, from a cost perspective. Uh, <laughs> you no, know, it's, it's huge. And, and politely submitted, it's turned 45 degrees to the road because of the existing geometry of the building. And we live in a day and age where I can see that building from two inches away to two miles away. And you just can't read the darn thing. It, it's, it's, it won't provide, it, it's not a great use of money to advertise the building, which is, that's what it's kind of for, is to show you the, what the it, building it, is. Yeah, and, and the blade uh, uh, was not designed to be uh, in conjunction with a colonial style roof, so. Uh, I, I guess I would leave that to David as to what that would look like in real life. I mean, you probably bring the picture up, David, right? Yeah, I can do that. Yeah. Uh, it looks okay. Uh, let me go down here to the ground. I mean... Let's pop something up. <coughs> you have to share yeah, your you're screen. You're not sharing right? your screen oh. at this point. Man, I'll tell you, it's hard to get good help. While he's pulling up, I'm going to go to Ms. Hendrickson and then Mr. Beely, and then we'll... Yeah, thank you. Um, I have a, a couple of... Uh, okay. Uh, all right, my mic is on, and let's see, it's going to... All right, let me try again. It seems to work. Yep. Um, I, I guess the first question I have, I believe, has been answered. Maybe if I sit back further. Uh, and that was what was in that space to begin with, whether it was pervious or impervious. And it seems that it's, it's already pervious. I'm excuse me, impervious. So there's no additional impervious uh, area being taken. I was concerned that, that there might be a garden there or something like that, but there isn't, I believe. Right, and the um, but the other question I have, and forgive my ignorance, 
is what is a blade wall? Exactly. I went online to try and find a definition, and I found a lot of companies that were willing to sell me a blade wall or to come and build one for me, but none that actually defined what it was. So for me, knowing exactly what it is helps me decide if it really fits in with what's there now uh, and to make that sort of a determination. So if somebody could enlighten me, I would really appreciate it. Paul, I can't hear the speaker very well. Yeah, the mic was turned off. Excuse me. Okay. Thank There's you. lots of things happening in here you can't see right now, Regina Marie. <laughs> oh no, I'm watching it. You guys almost knocked out my eardrums there. <laughs> it's one of the advantages of the new system. You can't see everything that's going on. <laughs> I apologize. No, it's it's definitely not your fault. <laughs> So the blade wall, the term is a term of convenience coined by Mercedes. In their typical prototype, it is parallel to the front facade of the building, set back a few feet, and actually just looks like a continuation of the building. Um, here it does not. Um, I wouldn't have designed this this way. I, we're presenting it because we serve many masters. One of them is Mercedes-Benz. So, um, I mean, if you lowered it, that would help. I don't know if it would. I, see, I don't think it's going to have much prominence anyhow because I've chose as many pictures as I could where the trees don't block it, and so you could see it. And if I showed it with the trees blocking it, you'd think I was being too cute. So um, it's, it's hard to see. When I use the software to go down the road, it's just hard to see. I, uh, can, you, can you bring up a Mercedes Benz dealership? Yeah. So yeah. it's supposed to look like? Yeah, that's an asset. Yeah. Hey, can we just, let's point out the blade wall in this picture. Sure. Or give us the, right there. There it is. Yeah. Right, okay. And this is the this is at the forty five degree angle that you're referencing. It is. Yes. Yes. And and it again it's from some angles it's prominent but it's it's as you can see it's tucked kind of away. So um, and then you know the the, the head on shots. Jean Marie, I see you. Just give me. There's a queue of questions here, so give me a minute. Okay. Um, yeah. So this has been attached to this building, atypical to what they would do in their prototype. Um, which is typically a flat roof. Yes, which if this were a, a flat roof, we probably would have come out along the side with it and it would look, we, wouldn't, we would be saying, why do you have that wall with no building behind it? Whereas here, it, it looks like an attachment you know, more like an attachment to the building as opposed to a continuation of the building. Um, I, I don't find it particularly good design, so it's, it is. Uh, but again, we're here serving multiple masters, trying to get permission to move forward and to inform Mercedes where we, you know, may have issues moving forward with what they've requested. But the main, the main fascia, uh, uh, we've been able to get an extension to complete this project until uh, November of 2021, which sounds far away, but it's not far away because we probably have a couple months of construction here. Well, uh, yeah, you'll want to start construction in the spring. You we, want to, yeah, you're going to be opening this building up significantly to, to, to gain that new space. The structure supports that angle, and that still can't stay. So. Mr. Beely, then Mr. Clucci, and then uh, Ms. Caterina. Uh, yes, um, it sounds like uh, we may be able to do you a favor by not approving the Mercedes wall. <laughs> well, uh, I, I wouldn't be trying if you didn't. I mean, I would have to go back to Mercedes Benz and, and tell them that you know it goes against the design standard, but I, I think it would be okay. I think we may be able to approve without that, uh, without that blade wall. I, 
Yeah, my next question was going to be how persistent is Mercedes? This this sounds seems to me like it might be some architects, you know, this, somebody's come up with this design for this particular building, and this is. Yeah, so we have a great relationship with them, yeah. uh, and uh, uh, I feel good about it. Uh, I, I'm not sure, but I feel good about it uh, that uh, you know we were able to negotiate with them regarding. I mean, they almost demand that we go to a flat roof, and we were able to to maintain that colonial style. So, uh, I mean, if the town blocks at the blade wall, uh, I will present it. I can present it to them, and and. Uh, I think, you know, in today's day and age, we may be okay. No, I would, I, yeah, I, I, that's, if that's how you, if that's how you feel, I think that that's something that should come as, you know, as, as notes to this meeting and we'll forward them to Mercedes. I just hope And we'll have some time to, to kind of, to revisit it, but I suspect that, that, that we'll be okay. I, I think that the customer contact points are what they're most interested in. And and they will be um, they will be improved. Uh, uh. Um, I I think the thing that um, at least it's my impression that auto dealerships basically do changes about every half dozen or ten years. Or about something ten, like I think that. the law is ten years. Yeah, they, they, they were doing it more. And right? we're seeing it all around the greater Portland area. Dealerships are upgrading <coughs> and, and coming up with some interesting designs. Um, personally, I don't have a big problem with the Blake Wall. Um, and I wanted to ask Jay, if I could, um, on the, um, the question about black. I was looking over the design standards. Now, maybe I didn't see the same section that you did, but I, I read the word primary color. Black is, is, is not allowed as a primary color. Mm -hmm. And I see this more as an accent or like a... Yeah. So. Yeah, I can pull up the language. I don't have it directly in front of me, but I, as as staff reads it, this would be the primary co color of that component of oh, the building. The blade so wall. yeah, okay. yep, of just the blade wall. Okay, I, I'm not talking about the pillars or anything else. Just saying this blade wall is a clear and distinct component of the building, se separate and distinct, as I just said. Sorry for repeating myself uh, from the building, and it's it's black, and so that. The design standards discourage it, and therefore I flagged it. And, and if I may add, they will push for it to be ACM. And my understanding is Land Rover had to get a uh, get permission to use, you know, ACM aluminum composite material. You know, the the, the okay. whatever it's worth. So we would, have to, if we do go forward with this, we'd have to have that discussion also. Okay. Uh, I have nothing further. Thank you, uh, Councilor Colucci, and then Councilor Caterina. Yeah, can, can you guys hear me? Okay. Um, when you tore down the Sunoco, did you add any square footage at that time? Yeah. So the, the Sunoco property was purchased, and at the same time we did the contract zone, buying the Sunoco property, enhancing it, turning it into parking. We also, at that same time, did what we're calling the sprinter edition, which are, you know, very high bay service areas with the car wash. So that was one contract zone amendment. Okay. Uh, so did the, uh, did the square footage roughly offset? For what you tore down versus what you built? No, maybe half to two thirds. I don't okay. recall how big, probably in footprint because there was a lot of extras that came with that small building. Yeah, little sheds and things. I'm sure you recall yeah. that it is definitely an improvement. Now. Was not necessarily a tidy space. Okay. I, I personally, I don't have an issue with the blade wall. I, I don't think it's going to be all that noticeable. Like you said, uh, you, you, you're driving by pretty fast. It's, a, it's, it's going to be subtle, I think. Um, so I wouldn't fight for or against it. Um, one thing that I've been, you know, thinking about with this is why are we having a joint workshop for a 350 square foot? addition um, on a property that's already pretty well improved. It's, it, you know, you're doing a lot of work inside. I'm glad to hear that. that it's a little bigger than just what, you know, what we're looking. But um, can you maybe talk to why um, we need to do this? Don't do that to us, John. That was, weird. That was Don and I's amendment. <laughs> well, uh, quite simply, I, I wasn't trying to go that far. <laughs> quite simply put, the original contract zone so tightly regulated by, uh, by 
by restricting or indicating the maximum square footage. So uh, we see similar issues with other contract zones for other reasons, such as Piper Shores had very specific numbers of units and types of units, and any variation from that requires a, an amendment. So it may be something for us to be mindful of in the heat of the moment with some controversy and about our concerns. There understandably is a desire to be very exact and precise, um, but that precision often uh, you know, ends up uh, being extra work in terms of de minimis, what some might say de minimis improvements, but they're technical, um, requires technically and legally an amendment to the contract zone. So it's it, a function of our own doing in some respects. And we need a contract zone for this because we don't allow, it's not, a car dealership is not an allowable use in town or in this zone, right? Correct. And, and this predated me, but my understanding is the public benefit, which is often a very important central discussion of at least these initial contract zones, was that site was a former fairly industrial site that was kind of run down, uh, you know, a number of dilapidated buildings, it being a gateway to our town. Uh, there was at the time, I think, a, a, a very, very much an interest to see that property redeveloped. And so that was really the driving force and the public benefit, so to speak. And one could argue that all the subsequent amendments have only gone to, you know, further that gateway and beautification. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Katarina, and then if there's nothing further, I'll move on to the planning board's part of the... Yeah, um, just very quickly, um, again, you know, I, I think the blade is superfluous, um, doesn't meet any architectural improvement or whatever. Uh, you heard Dan and Dave themselves say they just do not do it because of the expense involved. Um, that be it, as it may, the only thing I could think of was with McDonald's and the Golden Arches, because McDonald's used to have this rule, you know, they had to have these Golden Arches, and then they ran into planning board issues with all sorts of towns. And I can't imagine knowing Mercedes and knowing Mer where Mercedes dealerships are located uh, particularly in the Northeast, particularly in Massachusetts, uh, in Rhode Island, uh, and you've got these quaint little planned towns and whatever, that Mercedes can't come up with something better than that blade wall that would fit in, but um, uh, meet their needs for advertising or branding or whatever the heck they're doing there. Uh, again, I don't have an issue with the expansion of the that uh, customer uh, meeting area, client meeting area, whatever. Again, I'm looking at it from the public benefit point of view. I think, you know, that that would meet it. I don't see the public benefit at all to uh, a blade wall. Uh, so I'm sticking pretty close to, you know, what we need to be looking at when we're doing contract zones, because otherwise you're going to have people coming back and saying, oh, please, oh, please, oh, please, can we change it again? Oh, please, oh, please, oh, please. And, you know, I get a little crazy after a while. So, um, I can't imagine, again, that Mercedes can't come up with something. They, they caved on the, uh, the flat roof, um, which I'm glad because this is New England. We don't need flat roofs. Um, and um, that's just my two cents worth with it. Okay, we'll have time. The council will have time. We'll have time at the end to make our further comments. Uh, David, can you stop sharing your screen for, for us, please? Uh, the next item here is comments from members of the planning board concerning the land use implications of the proposed contract zoning amendment. So, uh, Mr. McGee, I'm going to let you chair this part of the discussion and we will observe. Just make sure your mic's on there. Yeah. Thanks. I uh, appreciate it. Uh, I do have a quick clarifying question. The, the sign out there right now, blue. It, the sign is blue. Correct. So, but if you're if you're proposing to change the building colors to uh, the black, would the sign uh, follow suit? And should if so, should that be part of this uh, amendment? Yeah. So uh, we're only proposing to uh, change the color of the columns and the entryway. The building will remain the same color. No, the the signs would the signs, signs. Would, the signs, signs would the, black, the, yeah. the pylon sign would remain the same except the color would be black. Yeah. Does that need to be a part, or can that go through a typical sign permitting process? 
So the sign, so the, 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 the color piece is really in the architectural standards, not the sign standards. Of, so I think we, as the planning board, that will be part of your due diligence when this comes to you, if should it come to you for your preliminary site plan review. Um, I don't believe it will require any contract zone adjustments. Um, if we discover that we're sort of part of this process, why it sort of first comes to this joint hearing and then comes back to plan board for preliminary site plan approval is if there are other things that the planning board finds that, you know, might be acceptable, but otherwise might need some adjustments in the zoning, there's opportunity, further opportunity for council and the um, applicant to have that discussion. But I, I don't believe that the, the changing that from blue to black is going to require anything in the contract zone itself. Thank you. Um, I did see that uh, Robin had her hand raised, so I'll, I'll see if Robin, go ahead. Yeah, um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Great. Um, I know that this is for comments, but I have one question for the applicant. Um, what if we said no? What happens? Uh, we would uh, report the findings back to Mercedes Benz, uh, and and that does that mean that you wouldn't have to put up the capital to do this? Uh, no, not necessarily. No, they may ask us to find another site uh, because uh, uh, they're pretty strict. You know, they are very strict, and uh, they uh, they actually uh, gave us an extension to November of next year. Uh, and if we don't get it done and don't get another extension. They actually uh, 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 fine us it, but by reducing our, our profit margins. Uh, I'm sorry to hear that. Okay, I I, I tend to um, my thoughts are along the same line as Councillor Katarina that it does seem superfluous, and I I see little to no public benefit in this. Um, are there any fees that the town would it? The, is there an annual fee for the contract zone amendment? No. No, there is not. Okay. Uh, There's I guess I'm all set, Mr. Chair. I, I guess just... I, I just uh, sorry, Robin. Uh, just no, to clarify, there, there is not an annual fee. There is a fee for the application. Um, so for this application, there was a fee, but that's a one-time thing. Mm -hmm. So would these improvements increase the value of the property at all? I think that uh, it, 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 from a, a tax-based perspective, it may because uh, the SWIFT really shows up and we're redoing, we're redoing the home. Sorry, we can't. We can't, uh, we can't hear, hear you. Yeah, we can't hear the response, but that's okay. I'm all. I'm, my my questions and comments are done, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And we still can't hear you on Zoom. Thanks, Robin. Yeah, can you hear me now? No. No. Yeah, go ahead. No. 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 Just, we still can't hear anything. Perhaps I can just repeat what I heard. Is that helpful? I, what was discussed is really improving the interior fit and finish and new furnishings. Um, that's really a matter for the tax assessor. I wouldn't expect it would necessarily have tremendous effect on overall value of the property. Um, certainly there would be some positive benefit, I suspect, but you know, the, the colors and the type of fit and finish uh, we really look at a, a grade factor, and I suspect this is graded fairly highly already. Um, so, you know, it remains to be seen, but I wouldn't see. It's not a dollar for dollar in terms of the investment that they're contemplating uh, translates into value. It's not that simple. Very nice summary. Thank you. Uh, Rachel. Uh, uh, all right, stand back. Um, yeah, I just want to reiterate uh, what I said before, but in the, the context of the land use. And uh, as far as I can see, because there's 
no increase in impervious uh, area uh, for the property uh, that would be occasioned by this increase in the square footage. Uh, I, don't, I don't see a, a problem with that increase. Uh, I do think there are a little problem with the design standards and that's with the blade wall. I also don't think that that's um, necessary or appropriate uh, on this site um, in terms of our design standards, but that's probably something that if you pass this contract zone amendment ultimately comes to the planning uh, board and I'll say the same thing there. Uh, so that's, that's my two cents worth. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, Roger or Rick, do you have anything to add? I'll just uh, quickly close by saying I, um, you know, I looking at from land use and, uh, you know, a minor, quote unquote, minor addition such as this is, it does not seem out of the ordinary for, for what the use is, what they need. It seems pretty minor, quote unquote, minor in the, in the scheme of what we typically would evaluate. So uh, from, from those perspectives, I don't see any uh, major issue if it gets in front of the planning board uh, going through this process. As Rachel pointed out, and a couple other people here um, on the design standard front, we may run into a deeper discussion. Um, for me personally, I have nothing against the color black and uh, the blade wall. It, it, it's a design element, and uh, they're going to change over time, just like uh, you know any other corporation out there. They'll have their design standards, but we'll work through it. I have faith that we could work through it. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, back to you. Thank you, sir. Uh, before our last one is preliminary town council discussion of the contract amendment, but I do want to be clear because this is straight from the audi audi um, ordinance, excuse me, and Jay has referenced this, but this is important. At the conclusion of the discussion, the council shall, by vote, advise the applicant to either withdraw the request for a, oops, sorry, withdraw the request for a contract zoning, two, to continue the process and request for contract zoning with, with or without modifications suggested by the council or three, to revise and resubmit the application altogether. So to be really clear, they are looking for some sort of guidance from us tonight. Um, so I didn't want to um, leave them hanging. So this is, they are gonna take what we say and, and then proceed accordingly. So um, who would like to start with their comments and then I'll take a consensus, Don? Yeah, uh, Turn your mic on, Don. Thanks very much for the discussion uh, uh, from all corners. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm fine with this going uh, going forward. Uh, you know, I, I don't see a need for modifications. Uh, you know, self-deprecating moment. There's an expression uh, that goes something like, "The Irish have no visual sense." So when I start giving advice on aesthetics and blade walls and colors and stuff like that, you know, the world's gone horribly wrong again. So I I think we just <laughs> let the process move forward and you know help these folks try to comply with corporate standards and oh by the way i kind of liked those old golden arches at mcdonald's so anyway that's what i have to say g marie <laughs> and then P peter after G. Marie. well with all due respect to mr hamill as a person of irish descent who's an artist i take offense but no. you know, i'm just you know, i'm just pulling your leg um i'm i'm fine with this moving forward but i would like to see some further discussion i'm not going to die on the blade wall but <laughs> i do i do have concerns about good, it good one. so there you go <laughs> peter did you have anything to add i'm just going around the table here yeah, I mean, I think where I'd be is, as you read, the options would be number two. I'm okay with the expansion of the customer space, but I would like to see modifications to the blade wall. I think it it doesn't really add any any added value. I think it doesn't really fit. Um, so I, I'd like to see the, the blade wall addressed and as it moves through the process. Thank you, sir. So to recap, we have three that say proceed. Two have expressed some hesitation with the blade wall. One has supported the blade wall. Councillor Johnson or Clucci, Mr. Clucci? Uh, yeah, I, uh, I think the blade wall is fine as well, but I, I kind of in Don's boat where I, I'm not really the right person to make that call. I mean, you guys, I, I'd support this going through the process and um, see what you guys can come up with. And I, I think that's the best way to get the best outcome. From my perspective, this is a small this amendment uh, to an existing contract zone that um, I have no business telling you no. Uh, I, I think it should move forward through the process, and I'd be happy to see it again. Okay, two to two-ish, I would say. Mr. Johnson? Well, I agree with uh, Councilor Clucci. Just move it forward to the planning board and let them uh, deal with any design standards that may be of concern. 
Yeah, and I guess I would echo, I guess everybody at the table has the same thoughts. I, I'm, I think the blade wall looks kind of sharp, and I know, I'm, I know franchise ease have a pretty, you know, you're held to many masters, as you said, and I'm sure you don't necessarily want to outlay all this cash, so I trust you will do what's most cost effective and fits the best for the planning board, so I am, I'm okay with everything as well, so. I believe at this point you have your answers to continue the process. I, I'm looking around, everybody's kind of nodding. I hope we're good. Everybody good? So, yeah, it would require a formal vote. I just want it do you want, okay, yes. sure. Um, so, Don, you want to make a motion? Uh, I make a motion that uh, uh, we move forward with the process uh, as explained. And as the, and I'll that second would, it. As the applicant submitted. As, yes. Okay, it's seconded, and I'm not going to accept discussion because we just had it, so let's just call it. So, Jay, do you want to call the vote? Or Tom, I guess, either one, sorry. Jay? Councillor Kluzzi? <laughs> yes. Councillor Katarina? Yes. Councillor Hayes? Yes. Councillor Hamill? Yes. Councillor Johnson? Yes. Chairman Johnson? Yes. Motion passes. Six, six zero. Thanks for putting up with us, guys. Appreciate it. And everybody in the room, there's a lot of mics here, so we appreciate it. There's a couple bumps on the road, but this is the first time I think we've had 14 mics within a five-foot radius of each other. So thanks for bearing with us. Paul, do you want to just announce to the Zoom attendees that we're going to need a five minutes just to kind of get switched around? Guys, I'm going to start the meeting probably at like 7.03 if I can get away with it, just so everybody can stretch their legs. Same Zoom meeting now, Paul? Different address?
excuse me, sorry. This is the Wednesday, September 2nd, 2020 regular count town council meeting um, for Scarborough, Maine. First item on the agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Item number three is roll call. Tody? Councilor Cucci? Here. Councilor Hayes? Councilor Katerina? Here. Councilor Johnson? Here. Councilor Hamill? Here. Chairman Johnson? Here. Thank you. Item number four is general public comments for items that are not on the agenda. General public comments for items that are not on the agenda. Let me check online, excuse me. Nothing online, okay. Item number five is approval of the minutes from the 20, uh, June 24th, 2020 town council meeting, August 5th, 2020 town council meeting, August 19th, 2020 town council meeting. Do I have a motion? So moved. Okay. Discussion? Tony? I will note that uh, Councilor Clucci found a, a vote wrong and I corrected it. So the minutes were oh, okay. redone. Mm -hmm. I did. Councilor Clucci? Yes. Councilor Hayes? Yes. Councilor Katerina? Yes. Councilor Johnson? Yes. Councilor Hamill? Yes. And Chairman Johnson? Yes. Thank you. Uh, item number six is adjustments to the agenda. Mr. Hamill? Yes, I'd like to recommend that we uh, move the town manager's update to the top of the order. Thank you, and without um, objection, I will move the town manager's report to the top of the order. Item number seven is items to be signed, which is treasurer's warrants. I will do those offline. And before we head into the public hearings, I will have the town manager's report. So, Tom? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Allow me to get myself organized. Uh, several matters to report on this evening. Um, members of council were made aware, I believe on the 21st of this month, uh, by the tax assessor that he did set the tax rate. So a, a tax commitment has been accomplished. Uh, the tax rate came, came in two cents lower than we had projected based on additional value that was uh, realized through uh, his, his detailed work and analysis. Um, you may recall we had originally projected at $14.88 or uh, 2 uh, excuse me, 1.24 percent increase on the tax rate. This was much debated and discussed uh, during the time of budget, budget approval. The final rate came in at 1486, which equates to just over uh, 1 percent uh, increase in tax rate. Uh, at the same time, he was also able to uh, provide significant funding to the overlay account. And that may come in <clears throat> very important for us, uh, given that a, a fairly sizable abatement that is pending uh, that I'll touch on in a moment. Um, he does intend to provide a more detailed and thorough analysis, kind of a, a book, if you will, uh, in the coming days. And so, so look forward to that for sure. Um, I'm pleased to mention that uh, we do have a finalized slate of candidates. Um, I know tody has been anxious. Today was the, uh, the final date, I believe at 6 o'clock, uh, for candidates to get their papers back in. So for the local elected office for Board of Education, we have two open seats. Uh, John Dittmer, John Dittmer, Leanne Casalionis, and Mary Lindstrom uh, have all sufficiently uh, turned in their papers and will appear on the ballot for, again, two vacant seats. For town council, for three vacant seats, uh, we have Jonathan Anderson, Jean Marie Katarina, John Clucci, Nicholas McGee, and Freyla Trepinian. Uh, all qualifying to appear on the ballot, again, for those three seats. And for the Scarborough Sanitary District, uh, for three open seats, we have three candidates, Jason Greenleaf, uh, Benjamin, Mc, Benjamin McDougall, and Ruth Summers. So just pleased to have that piece done. Um, I know Tody's anxious to send uh, the final proof to our printers to get our ballots printed and back in time so we can uh, meet the early voting requirements. Um, the council will recall under emergency order back in May of, of this year, um, you extended some business assistance allowing businesses to occupy uh, you know, sidewalks and areas of parking in front of their place of business. Uh, that's been very well received. I think you've seen many of these businesses that have 
uh, been able to operate uh, a bit differently and, and in many cases have as many seats uh, through that modified arrangement as they had before. Uh, you may have noticed that there's uh, a lot of interest in looking at the next four to six months in terms of what the requirements are and restrictions they'll have to work under. We're aware that a number of them are looking at how to modify that in more winterized uh, fashion. Um, there may be some challenges with fire code and heating with outdoor tent spaces, but uh, we're interested in working through that. So I'm just kind of putting you on note that we may come back to you and look to extend that beyond, um, at this point, the, the, that um, ends at the middle of October. So it may well be that we wish to come back and have you consider an extension to that. Uh, just an update on our COVID-19 awareness grants. We have applied for and received two different grants, totaling about $157,000. Um, the sorts of things that we're, we've done with this money and, and will continue doing, uh, we've hired a number of community ambassadors. Uh, they've spent most of their time in the beach areas, in those areas where crowds tend to congregate. Um, very, very good feedback from the ambassadors themselves and also from folks that have the occasion to, to be in touch with them. We have all sorts of communication. You'll see some signage out in front of Town Hall um, and, and, a, and again at our beach areas. Uh, we're doing all sorts of print materials that will be going out in the community and some video work as well. There's PPP that we're purchasing, uh, not, not for staff, but really for public use, and we're handing them out through the ambassador program. Uh, in the second, ground, second round, we also have some, um, able to advance some fit testing for the N95 masks. This is for our public safety personnel that do have a requirement because of the function of their jobs. Uh, to wear the higher level N95 masks. Those do uh, require specific fit, fit testing uh, to be safe and, and uh, appropriate. Um, so we have a piece of equipment that's gonna help us uh, do that uh, locally. Very pleased to have that, uh, not just for now, but going forward as well. We're also able to do some retrofitting in the revenue office up front. We've made some temporary arrangements. If you've been in there, held on with, uh, you know, uh, two by fours and, and uh, vice grips, I think. Uh, it's fairly crude, but quite effective. Uh, we expect that uh, those are good measures that we should be taking long term. So we're looking at a more permanent retrofit uh, using these funds. Uh, and again, some, some further communication work. Uh, lastly, I should mention that I'm able to cover two months of the cost that salary and benefits of our um, communications coordinator position. We've not hired that person, but we do have approved funding, so that will help offset some of those, those expenses. While I mentioned that, um, that recruitment is fully underway. In fact, we have closed it uh, this past Sunday. We've asked Councillor Johnson as communications chair to be part of the interview panel, um, and very pleased with uh, at least early indication the, the candidate pool that we're working with. So pleased to move that forward um, and have some further update in the future. Uh, a reminder to council and to the public, as we look at early voting, essentially the whole month of October is early voting period. Uh, with all the space restrictions, um, we really need use of and unlimited use of these two chambers for that to operate. It's just not, we're not able to tear that down and put that back up uh, to allow public meetings. So we'll either be looking for alternative meeting sites uh, or we can switch back to virtual meetings, which I think we've become quite accustomed to. So I'll work with council leadership, but again, we're gonna be switching back for the month of October, really to allow early voting to happen um, safely and efficiently here at Town Hall. Uh, I guess lastly, I'll just mention, I will be attending a, what I expect will be a day-long mediation. This is for an ongoing uh, tax abatement with Piper Shores. Uh, they are our largest taxpayer by far. Um, we have been through previous mediations with them that have fail to produce any results. And part of the challenge there is that we had a number of factors confusing and complicating the conversation. I believe Council Hamill, Hamill were, was part of at least one of those mediation sessions. Uh, we do have the exemption issue cleared and we're hopeful that that's gonna help focus the discussion. And as I said earlier, uh, we do have funds through the overlay in the current uh, fiscal year uh, to potentially um, you know, meet a settlement that may, may come out of that process. Um, all of that, that process you know, certainly involves the council approval, uh, but I'm anxious to see if we can make any headway. Uh, at this point, there's two tax years in question. We'll be sending out tax bills uh, next week, so I suspect uh, in all intents and purposes, we're talking about three tax years in question. Um, 
and it's, it's a big deal. Again, they're our largest taxpayer. I think I can say from my perspective, I'm interested in moving past this to the extent we can, and it makes sense for us to do that. So that's my attitude going into this, and I'll certainly report back results to the council. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, that's uh, what I have tonight. Thank you, sir. Any questions for Tom from the councilors? Okay. With that, we're going to move on. We have a, I think we have a batch of four or five public hearings and then another public hearing and new business. Uh, just a quick note before I do start the public hearings, we've received a, a, a fair amount of emails uh, for some of the things on the agenda. If you're watching at home or in the audience, I, I will not read your email today unless you request it. So if you email us, uh, please know that we've read it. If, but unless I'm instructed to do so, I won't read it into the record. Um, just so if you do want it read, read into the record in the future, just tell me to do so, and I absolutely will. Uh, so with that, uh, next is order number 20063. It's a 7 p.m. public hearing and second reading on the proposed amendments to Chapter 311, Town of Scarborough Schedules of Fees. And I don't... I believe this has been before us, I feel like, five times, but I know that's incorrect. <laughs> so is there, uh, Tom, do you want to speak yeah. to it briefly? And Very then quick introduction. Yeah. This was really a companion piece to a, a, a set of ordinances you passed about six months ago dealing with a new fire alarm system. Uh, these additional new fees were part of that conversation and actually included as part of the revenue estimates in the FY21 budget. So we're just trying to play a little catch up here and, uh, and codify them in the schedule of fees. Thank you. Is there anybody in the public that would like to speak to this? There's not. So with that, I am going to ask for a motion because this is a second reading as well. So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? Tody? Councillor Clucci? Yes. Councillor Hayes? Yes. Councillor Katarina? Yes. Councillor Johnson? Yes. Councillor Hamill? Yes. Chairman Johnson? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, order number 20064 is a 7 p.m. public hearing only on regarding the authorization of this credit enhancement agreement for Scarborough Downtown Omnibus Municipal Development and Tax Increment Financing District for Jocelyn Place Senior Affordable Housing, an authorization of, of and delegation to the town manager to execute such agreement in a substantially in substantially the form as presented to the town council. Before I do open this up to the public, our attorney Shauna is on the line and I Last meeting, we had a couple of edits that we had suggested and actually one we actually voted on. So I believe she has an update from the developer. So I think it probably makes sense for us to do that before the public hearing. So it's so we're pretty much know exactly where we're landing on this. Uh, Shauna, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? I can. And let me know if you need me to share anything or you can do it or what have you. So. Um no, I think I, what I'll do is just review where we're at, and then um, hopefully the, the council has been able to see um, my memo that was contained in the council packets as well, which summarizes the two follow-up items that, that we're asking for some feedback on. Um, but as folks know, this is um, a proposal for a 60-unit senior affordable housing development project. Um, the South Portland Housing Authority's affiliate entity, Oak Hill Senior Housing Limited Partnership, would be the um, other party to the credit enhancement agreement. It, the proposal is, is for a 75% reimbursement for a 20-year period of time, um, and that provides the developer with three points in the valuable LIHTC federal housing um, tax credit competition process. Um, the two provisions that we're asking for some feedback on relate to um, points of discussion in prior council meetings as well as um, council workshop. And at this point, what we want to do is get feedback so that we can finalize what the document says so that the public hearing will be informed of that for this evening as well as um, the second reading, which is anticipated to occur at your next council meeting you'll have that final document, um, you know, understood. So um, the, the first one, as folks may remember from the first reading evening, the council voted by motion to revise the assignment provision um, and remove some language that would require the council to um, 
act reasonably in um, authorizing any future assignments of the agreement that are not for purposes of um, security in a financing arrangement. So other types of assignments would have, um, as it's currently stated, um, the council would have complete discretion about whether to authorize those types of assignments. And as um, following the conversation with um, the developer's attorney, who I'm, I'm told that their folks are also available to take questions and respond to this themselves, um, but they had some conversations with their investors and wanted to propose um, putting that language back in, but adding to it a qualifier. And I think the concept here is they are wanting to give voice to what they believe the council's primary concern to be, which is that the use of the property remain to be affordable housing. And so they've added this in to say, which consent shall, the consent of the council for assignments, that is, shall not be unreasonably withheld, delayed, uh, or delayed so long as the use of the property remains affordable housing subject to an extended use agreement. And, um, and I will, Sort of maybe what I'll do is um, just pause there and move on to the second item and then transfer it back to the chair for further discussion or questions to the developer um, just for ease of, of discussion. So, um, so there is this proposal from the developer that, that there be a reconsideration on that language um, with, a, with a new uh, revision. Um, the other proposal the developer and I spoke about um, relates to concerns that um, hey, were Shana. raised. Hey, Shauna, yeah. can we yeah, just yeah. can we take that one alone and then can we talk about this one and then go on to number two? No problem. That's okay. fine too. Okay, I just I just feel like it'd be easier for us to keep track of it. Um, okay, sure, sure. Sorry to interrupt. No worries. So essentially, for those in the public and for us to recap, last meeting, um, Mr. Hamill proposed an amendment that essentially struck the language of that we cannot withhold transfer of the property um, for unreasonable, unreasonable reasons is obviously not what I'm looking for, but that's what I'm going for. Um, the developers have come back with this language that, that they believe addresses our concerns. And I think Sean is looking for us to say, OK, we feel like we're in a good spot here seeing that we're coming down to the wire. So with that, I guess I will just kind of have us weigh in on it as a council. Um, does anybody want to weigh in on what the developer has written here in the underlying bolded part? Mr. Hamill? Yeah, I was uh, pretty outspoken on this, so I understand uh, you know, what the, the uh, investor is saying. Uh, you know, and I, I appreciate uh, uh, what they've done to try to uh, mitigate the impact, uh, whatever that, that might be, of you know, putting the language back in. So and making sure that this would be, you know, operated as affordable housing and not uh, for some other purpose. So I, with that change, I'm, you know, I think I'm okay with that. Yeah, I'm, I'm just gonna, I'll quickly, to move it along, I'll echo that. So it, if anybody else has any, I'm seeing nods, so. Yeah, I'm okay. fine with it. Okay, and this will be adjusted at second reading. I'm just trying to make sure we're all in a good spot at second reading. So, Shauna, that sounds like that's okay. I'm looking to Peter and Jean Marie just for their feedback. I guess a thumbs up, two thumbs up. Okay, uh, Shauna, you wanna go on to number two, please? Shauna, if I could, are sure. you looking for any sort of vote or is that sufficient direction for you? I think in, in this particular case, I'd love for the council to take a vote to direct us in this regard, simply because there was a formal motion at the first reading to make this language change. And I want it to be complete before the public hearing occurs this evening, just for, from a procedural perspective, if that is possible. Sure. Councilor Katarina or Councilor Hamill, you want, you're good at offering up motions on the fly, either one of you? Councilor Katarina, you want to go for it? Um, la, 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 la. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well done. Is there a second? I move, no, I, uh, I move that uh, at this point we insert um, in whatever the section is. 7 2. Yeah, 7 2. Which uh, sub one, which consent shall not be reasonably withheld or delayed so long as use of property remains affordable housing subject to extended use agreement? Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any more discussion on it? Tori? Okay. Councillor Cucci? Yes. Councillor Hayes? Yes. 
Councilor Caterina? Yes. Councilor Johnson? Yes. Councilor Hamill? Yes. And Chairman Johnson? Yes. It's unanimous. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Shauna. Thanks for keeping us in line there. Uh, you want to go on to number two? Sure. Um, the second one um, relates to another point of discussion in prior meetings, um, the condition on the repayment or the, or the payments under the CEA to the developer um, related to its local preference for tenant selection and wanting that to be a little firmer. And so um, we had worked on this language really together with the developer's attorney trying to ensure that they went as far as they felt they could go, um, but, but that it still um, gives the town more than was in the, the language previously. And so what you'll see here in the memo is under number two of section 3.1C, that would be replaced with stronger language than exists currently, which says requires um, that in every CEA year in order to receive a payment under the CEA that the developer has implemented and applied in accordance with applicable law and regulations a local preference for individuals living or working in Scarborough in its tenant selection plan for the project. The developer shall provide to the town an annual certification of its compliance with this section 3.1c. Thanks, Shauna. So I think what I'll do is let's just structure this in the form of a motion and then we'll have a discussion to make it easier. So Jean Marie, do you want to? Yeah, um, I move that sec uh, section two, 3.1 C sub two uh, be worded, has implemented and applied in accordance with applicable law and regulations of a local preference for individuals living and working in Scarborough and its tenant selection plan for the project. The developer shall provide to the town and you know, certification of its compliance with the section 3.1c. Thanks, Jim. Is there a second? Second. And I'll open this to discussion. I'd like to uh, say that I think it's uh, a good revision. Uh, and I think additionally, uh, you know, Councillor Gleistein is not here, but I know she's been in conversations with the folks at the South Portland Housing Authority, and they, they actually have uh, uh, a practice uh, that they that they've used, which uh, I think would would fall in line with this requirement. Yep. And actually, can I, I'll, I'll share the practice because I it's just in, it was interesting. Um, so we know um, a veteran applicant who lives in Scarborough gets a four points added to the so that so the mm -hmm. so the applicants that live there get it's a point scale similar to the point scale they're dealing with. So anyways, a veteran applicant who lives in Scarborough gets four points. An applicant who lives or works in Scarborough gets three points. A veteran who lives and works in another community gets one point. And then an applicant who lives and works in any other community gets zero points. So just this was informative for me to read, so I appreciate it. So that, that's my comments on this. Uh, Councillor Hayes? It, just a question on what that actually, what those words actually mean. I mean, if what you just read in is their regulations they're going to go by, don't we want to codify that in this? Because this, this just leaves it pretty vague, doesn't it? Local preferences I, I, for individuals living or working, it will be in accordance with applicable law, which it has to be in regulations, a local preference. I mean, I guess my question, don't we want to codify what that, what that criteria will be in this document? Because how are we going to be able to regulate it, comply, measure compliance? I think it. I think because it references the capitalized tenant selection plan for the project, but I don't. Shauna, I'll have, like, can you respond to Peter, Shauna? Yeah, I, I actually may ask that you recognize someone from the developer to speak to this, but I think what their response would be is that they need some flexibility into the future because of the complexity of the federal regulations regarding tenant tenant selection plans in general, and so they fully intend to. Uh, I, I, based on the other correspondence that some folks are um, referencing, they fully intend to employ um, this plan that they already use elsewhere and don't have any expectations that that would change, but they need to leave themselves some flexibility based on, you know, in order to maintain their federal tax credit compliance, they need to, to um, give themselves that. Um, 
Gary, can you respond to that? I just brought you into the meeting and you're on, I believe you're unmuted. Yes, thank you. Can you hear all hear me? We can, yep. Great, so this is Gary Vogel. I'm an attorney in Portland. I represent South Portland Housing and its affiliates and, um, and worked with uh, Shauna on drafting this language as well as in the prior matter, um, you know, the prior motion that you did. And by the way, thank you for uh, addressing our concerns on that one. So um, regarding this item, you know, we do have a tenant selection plan. That is, you know, that is a defined term in housing law that um, we're obligated to put forward. Um, the law does recognize um, local preferences that we can provide, um, but it is complicated in connection with uh, all of the fair housing regulations and they do change from time to time. So that's a lot of the reason why we drafted it the way we did was to make sure that while we absolutely intend to do this and certify to the town each year that we are um, you know, complying with that provision of the credit enhancement agreement, we do need some flexibility to make sure that we're staying in compliance with the federal law and regulations under fair housing, um, you know, as it's applied to this project. I, I do think that one way to address this concern is maybe to provide some detail in our annual certification as to how that works. And that would at least, you know, give the town um, you know, an opportunity to really review that point system, you know, each year, if we made a change in that and you got a certification, you know, in a following year, then it would be given an opportunity for, you know, for the town and the, uh, you know, and the project um, to, you know, to explain how and why we're still, you know, in compliance with the agreement. So that would be my uh, recommendation. Thank you, sir. Any other comments? Just if I could offer my perspective, being the one that will probably receive this annual report and review it for sufficiency, uh, that's certainly something I'll be looking for. Um, I think it's important to note that uh, this language sits in Article 3 called payment obligations. So the consequence of them not complying is fairly dire. Uh, essentially, we can withhold payment. And I credit Shauna for um, proposing this language uh, in this in this article. So. Um, that, along with the fact that we have a, an established, uh, well-respected organization that's not likely to be going anywhere anywhere soon, um, you know, gives me a level of confidence that they'll be um, shooting straight on this, and we'll have an annual check to make sure that that's the case. Thank you, Paul. Sorry, uh, <laughs> I, I just wanted to comment that I, I think that the way this is proposed is actually um, better language. Um, because otherwise there would be the risk that should we change our um, local definition of affordable housing, it could conflict with the federal standard. And then there, uh, you know, South Portland housing is in a bind. Do I follow federal law or state law or risk not losing the CA? So I, I think it's a good ad. I think it leaves some flexibility for things to change over time. So I, I support just it. One analogous point, um, I'll, I'll recall just the conversation in the contract zone. Um, the point was raised, why is a de minimis 350 a square foot addition in front of us, it's because uh, it was written so discreetly that any violation, um, you know, causes it to be back in front of you. So I think the same theory of drafting and what I hope this language does is, is really capture the essence of what you're trying to do and assure proper compliance without adding that level of specificity that could be problematic. Thank you, everybody. Anybody else? Okay, so again, this is just a public hearing, so we're just going to vote briefly on the language changes, and then we're not talking about this for the rest of the night. We're just opening up the public hearing. So with that, Tony, would you like to um, call a vote on the amendment? Councillor Clucci? Yes. Councillor Katarina? Yes. Councillor Hayes? Yes. Councillor Johnson? Yes. Councillor Hamill? Yes. Chairman Johnson? Yes. Thank you. Motion passes. Thank you. So all those that are looking to speak on this, we apologize for that little sidebar. Shauna, thank you for all your work on this. I think you've been very responsive to the concerns that have been raised, so we appreciate it. Very welcome. I'm going to kick everybody out of the meeting. Don't take it personally. Gary, thank you, sir. Okay, at this point, uh, is there anybody in the audience? Uh, Ms. Bristol, I, I will read your email. I see you're in here. You can, also, you can also read your own email if you like. Either one is fine with me. Um, I'm going to bring in March. Marge, just go ahead and unmute yourself, and then go ahead. 
Okay, um, I am Marge DeSanctis. I live on Beach Ridge Road. I am the chair of the Scarborough Housing Alliance. Uh, we did have a presentation by uh, Brooke Moore um, uh, about a month ago. <laughs> I don't even know it was that long. And um, I just want to uh, reiterate our support for this project. Yeah. Uh, because we do need uh, affordable house, more affordable housing. Um, I did talk to Tom today and back in 2018, I think it was, we started a tracking mechanism on how much affordable we have in the town. And um, I plan to put that on our agenda again on our next meeting to start updating that and keeping it more current so that we always have um, an ability to know where our affordable is and um, if it's specific to seniors or section eight or you know what the circumstances around it are so that we can uh, track affordable housing as it relates to the comprehensive plan and our goals. Marge, so I, I know this yeah. is a public hearing, but I, I know all of us, I speak for all, would appreciate, I think a lot of times we end up asking staff for a lot of this. So anytime the committee can step in and help out, I think it would help all of us. So. Thank well, you. we may we may need staff occasionally. Well, but, sure, uh, right, but <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> thank but you. But we have started it, and I just plan on bringing it up to date and uh, working on keeping it more current. Awesome, thank you very much. You're welcome. Are there any others in the audience that would like to speak to the Jawson place? I have three emails to read currently. Uh, Gary, I'll bring you back in. Uh, thank you. So uh, Gary Vogel, again, attorney for South Portland Housing. I just wanted to, you know, thank the town for um, the opportunity to, you know, to uh, work on the details on this. Um, uh, Shauna has been, you know, great to work with and you've been, um, you know, receptive to our concerns. Um, the, you know, the, the TIF, as Shauna said in her, in her um, comments, is really a key element of being able to get the tax credits that enable us to, you know, to bring the project to Scarborough because it's very competitive under our, you know, current, um, the, the current uh, system. There's about um, five or six new projects under the 9% tax credit that are allowed every year and maybe a equal number under, you know, the 4% tax credit. Um, and without the tax credits, these projects really can't, you know, can't be built. And so um, South Portland Housing is really pleased to be able to, uh, you know, sort of um, extend their reach into uh, Scarborough. It is part of their charter to serve um, the communities of, of uh, South Portland and Scarborough, even though we're not sort of designated by Scarborough as a as a um, you know as a housing authority, um, it, it still is part of their you know part of their um, mission. And so uh, this would be the first project that South Portland Housing Authority is doing in Scarborough, and I think they would hope that it would be uh, um, the first of many because obviously there's a you know strong need for affordable housing. So. Um, and just thank you uh, for um, considering this. The timing is also important. We have to get our application into main housing, um, you know, sometime in September, shortly after, you know, your meeting at which the second reading would be held. And that's where we can be able to certify that we've, uh, that we've gotten the, um, uh, the TIF that would give us the points that are necessary. So again, thank you. Thanks, Gary. Uh, Marge, I'll pull you back in here. Bear with me. Okay, Marge, you are live. Um, I didn't, did I not raise my hand again? You did, but I can boot you out again. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Nope, I was done. Thank okay. you. Okay. Nice talking to you again. All right. <laughs> Any more? Yes, sir. If you want to go ahead and take the mic and just tell your name and your address. Sound like that mic's good, right? Okay. I'm Michael Murphy from Highland Avenue. I have a quick question on number of years of the TIF. 20. The paper says 27, but. It's been adjusted since then. Is this a done deal? We need to vote on it. There's a second reading. Okay. 
and it's a public comment, so I, I, you can ask me questions online. But me, you, I'm not supposed to be going back and forth with you. Okay, well, but I, I could, you can. I, I have a, I have a grave problem with South Portland applying for a 75 percent tax increment financing in the town of Scarborough. Okay. Uh, I think that Scarborough should work more with your senior citizens. I am 73 years old. I have to work full time to pay my damn taxes. And I don't make $83,000 a year, but I can't do it on Social Security. And I think that the town should work more favorably. And if they want to give a tax increment financing, they should give it to everybody over 65. That's the gist of it. They are literally pushing the senior citizen out of this town. There's no way we can continue to afford the tax rate as is. So, like I say, if it's a done deal, then it's water over the bridge. My comments are done then. Yeah. And like I said, if you have any questions, we can I can totally answer them over email for you. Mr. Chair. Yes. Um, I, 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 um, I'm sorry. Jean Marie, I, I, don't, I, 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 we're not going to debate residents. I think if that's no, where we're I going. Just no, I, I'm not debating any residents. I just think it's a point of clarification for, because I hear it frequently. There's a misconception that South Portland Housing Authority is the city of South Portland, and it's not. That's just the name of the development, the developer or whatever you want to call it. I just needed to, to okay. point that out. Okay. Any others in the audience or online? Okay, with that, I'm going to read three emails into the record. I will read them in the order in which they came into my inbox. Uh, August 31st is from uh, Mr. Brian Shumway. He lives at Five Memory Lane in Scarborough. Dear town councilors, I am writing to express my support for the Jocelyn Place apartment proposal that is presented to the town council and urge the council to approve the proposed TIF agreement as requested at a rate of 75% for 20 years. I've had the opportunity to review the proposal in my role as a volunteer with the Scarborough Housing Alliance and as a professional affordable housing developer no, and know that the proposal is both necessary and appropriate for the needs of the town. Jocelyn Place will be a new construction development that serves seniors earning below 60% of the area median income. For a two-person household income, this equates to $48,000 a year. For a one-person senior household, this equates to $42,000 a year. These households are often on fixed incomes and struggle to live in safe housing that accommodates mobility needs while remaining affordable. Jocelyn Place will provide all these key features exactly what this community has been asking for years. This project is an important step to helping Scarborough achieve its affordability goals and its commitment under the comprehensive plan. When the downtown TIF district was drawn, it was drawn to provide a vehicle for advancing the policy goals and values of the town of Scarborough using TIF as a tool to achieve these goals. Help, helping a socially responsible nonprofit developer build affordable housing for Scarborough seniors on a vacant piece of land seems like the best use of for this policy tool. As a 15 year resident of Scarborough, a father of four, an active community volunteer, and a professional affordable housing developer, I urge you to support this proposal for Jocelyn Place by approving the TIF for 20 years. In addition to housing for 60 senior for 60 senior households, the project will generate significant economic activity for the town of Scarborough, including approximately 50 to 60 construction jobs. Unfortunately, without an award of the tax credits for main housing, this project will not be built in the aforementioned housing units and construction jobs will continue, continue to be goals rather than realities. In order to increase the chances of getting funding, the developer must score as many points as possible to, dem to demonstrate significant local financial commitment. The, proposal 75, the proposed 75% TIF for 20 years will generate three out of four possible points for the developer's proposal and will make these goals a reality. I thank you all for your service on the council and for the time you've taken time to learn about and understand this complex issue. If, you have, if you'd like to discuss this any further, please reach out to me. I'm paraphrasing his last paragraph. Number two is dated Wednesday, September 2nd. This is from Mr. Matt Early. I do not have his address, but I'm sure we will find it. He is a Scarborough resident. He says, I'm writing to you as a Scarborough resident asking that the TIF request for South Portland housing for the new senior project housing proposal be supported by town. I'm not working on this project in my, in my banker role, but I've worked in other projects with the South Portland Housing Authority and other areas, nonprofit affordable housing developers and operators. 
Two in my pipeline presently in Portland and South Portland have 30-year TIFs at 75% of tax amounts. These were crucial in operating budgets to lower costs so that affordable rents can be sustained given the high cost of construction and operational expenses. We also are able, we, excuse me, we also are able to place an appraised value on the TIF, which allows us to further leverage funding, which is a subsidi which at subsidized and below market interest rates to support the development costs. I have had mixed opinions and not always been fully supportive of TIF requests, but I think several key factors are important to consider in this project and request. South Portland Housing Alliance is a well-established and financially secure nonprofit sponsor that will not only develop the project, but will continue to operate long into the future as its mission to, is to own and operate the affordable housing. This is not a for-profit developer with commercial tenants that are paying real estate taxes under triple net lease terms, which the developer and owner, quote, double dips on, by getting the taxes then refunded by the town, which they pocket or flip and sell at a premium based on the added tax reimbursement value. I am not saying I'm fully opposed to other examples, but I've worked with some projects and this seems unnecessarily and excessive, and, uh, and others were, excuse me, others where the development and operational cost structures made it necessary for the project to become viable. To that point, the goal here is to provide affordable housing in a complex and, and expensive development market and many resources, including the proposed TIF, are commonly needed to develop the architecture that allows for the rents to be viable and sustainable. I also think it's important to consider that this is a senior housing project. This will help allow our aging population to age in a place here in our community, particularly our more vulnerable income restricted senior population. For those concerned about raising taxes and costs, and I am one of them, this senior housing project should not place any significant burden on the schools or, other, or our community financial systems. Thank you for your consideration and please share with the council members. I apologize if I misread anything. I'm trying to get through them. My third one is on my phone, so apologies, but it just came in and I, perfect. No, it's not, it's right here. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Uh, this is from Alliston Bristol from Six Bayview Avenue. It says, dear counselors, first, thank you and Mr. Hall for revising the terms of the CEA years, which appears will now provide a considerable cost savings to the taxpayer. A few additional comments, questions for tonight's public hearing. Regarding Article 3, 3.1c of the draft CEA, implementing a local preference for individuals living, quote, uh, excuse me, living or, I'm, I'm adding her emphasis, living or working in Scarborough, puts a non-Scarborough resident working in town on par with a Scarborough residence, which defeats the purpose. Might there be a residency requirement for a minimum number of years? Um, in, for example, along the lines of the property tax assistant or homestead exemption criteria. Also, unless I missed it, there doesn't appear to be any age requirements in the CEA. In other words, do seniors mean 55 plus? Her other point is of 6A of July 31 Q&A attachment to the August 15th workshop agenda, stated that 10% of new housing development must be affordable. How much, of the how, how much of that requirement has or has not been met up with other affordable housing projects in the pipeline? As I understand it from the August 7 long range planning meeting discussion on growth management, a maximum of 135 permits are allowed annually in Jocelyn Place would be calculated as 30 units, which is 22% of the 135 and less, and less taking Jocelyn out of the reserve pool changes the equation. Also, if the Downs developers are building Jocelyn Place, would they, would, they, would they then exceed their allocations of permits by the builder? Thank you again for your ongoing due diligence. Respectfully, Allison. I apologize for monotoning some of those, but it is difficult to get through those sometimes. Not because of the opinions, but just because reading in public. Uh, before I close the public hearing, would you like to come up, sir? Sir, I received a letter commenting that uh, you will be uh, discussing the request for a marijuana establishment license. Yep, that's two items down. We're almost there. Oh. Yep. We should there. We should be there in a couple minutes. Yep. Any others? Okay, with that, I'm going to close the public hearing. Thank you, everybody. Order number 2065 is a public hearing and second reading on, on the order authorizing issuance of up to $1.2 million in bonds of the town to fund the cost of the new ladder truck and to place the following question on the November 3rd, 2020 ballot. It shall read, uh, the ballot shall read, order authorizing issuance of up to $1.2 million in bonds of the town to fund the cost of a new ladder truck be approved. And Tom, I butchered the lead into this last time, so I'm gonna let you do it. 
I guess the lead in. Uh, this Can you put your, came, put your mic on. Yeah. This matter came forward uh, through the budget process this spring and was improved as part of the FY21 capital budget. Uh, because of the amount of the, the, the bo requested bonds, it does require voter approval. And in my mind, uh, that's really what controls here. So it was essential for it to be considered and kind of vetted through the budget process. It did survive that. And now it's up for uh, your consideration as to whether or not you wish to put it to the voters uh, for the November ballot. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we are under uh, some time crunch. Um, there's really no room for you to, to waiver, either up, voted up or down tonight. And I don't mean to put you on the spot, but uh, we do need to get the ballots uh, printed uh, and back in, in our hands in time for early voting. So um, I would just note, um, we do include a, a fiscal note uh, the total cost we estimate, uh, including interest expense, is just over $1.5 million. Uh, and that's a, a real important part for the voters to understand what they're being asked to vote on here. I do expect the fire department and their affiliate groups to do some uh, education uh, on the matter. And I believe this is replacing a frontline uh, piece of apparatus that is uh, 30 years old or will be 30 years old by the time this new one comes in service. So. Um, it certainly seems as though we have got our money out of the, uh, the current piece of uh, equipment. Thank you, sir. Uh, and I, I, just to clarify, this, this wasn't our capital budget that went to the voters. So this, they have seen this in the capital budget. Um, so this is a public hearing and second reading. So I, with that, I'll open up to the public. Anybody in the audience or online? Okay, with that, I'll close the public hearing and I'll take a motion. So moved. Second. Second. And discussion? <laughs> Councilor Clucci? Uh, yeah, I just want to comment. We, we did have a somewhat lengthy discussion on this topic uh, with the Finance Committee. And uh, it, as probably most people are aware, we, we slashed almost the entire capital budget with the exception of this truck. Uh, the thought being that it's so old right now. Um, if we wait another year, it takes a year to a year and a half to go through the process of ordering and actually getting a truck delivered that we might be out uh, you know, without uh, a second truck. So uh, that's why the Finance Committee had supported moving it forward. And if, uh, Peter, if you want to clarify anything, um, please feel free. Uh, so I totally support moving this to the voters. And, and thank you. Peter, do you want to piggyback on that? or? No, I, I totally agree with John. We did have a, a long conversation about it, both during the budget process, and it is because of the lead time, and it takes a year or two to manufacture. Um, so yeah, I mean, we this is the prudent thing to do. It is about the only major capital item that made it through the budget. So I, I recommend that we approve this also. Thank you. Any others? Tony? Councilor Clucci? Yes. Councilor Hayes? Yes. Councilor Katerina? Yes. Councilor Johnson? Yes. Councilor Hamill? Yes. Chairman Johnson? Yes. Unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Order number uh, 2071 is a 7 p.m. public hearing only, I believe. Yep. It's public hearing only on the new request for the following marijuana establishment licenses and schedule final approval for Wednesday, September 16th, 2020. The, light, the establishments are Agricults LLC, located at 10 Snow Canning Road for medical marijuana cultivation facility and High Test Laboratory, LLC, DBA uh, Canna Conversions, located at 3 Commercial Road for medical manufacturing facility and for adult use ma manufacturing facility, and Port City Farms, LLC, located at 3 Commercial Road for a medical marijuana cultivation facility and for adult, adult use cultivation facility, and Up North Gardens, LLC, located at 10B Snow Canning Road for medical marijuana cultivation facility, a reminder, this is a public hearing. We're not voting on anything. We're just here to listen to what you have to say in the room or online. So with that, you can approach the mic if you'd like to speak, or you can raise your hand in the Zoom meeting. Yep, go right ahead, sir. Could I offer just a couple of introductory comments? Can you? Oh, I'm sorry. Can you? Yeah. Could I offer just a couple of introductory comments as he, as he takes the, the mic? I just wanted to kind of put this in context. Uh, this is the first, I'll call, wave of applications. Uh, we have a, a very new ordinance. Many of you work diligently through the ordinance committee and then as council members uh, to pass that ordinance. As you recall, there are various different types of establishments uh, that are allowed under that, and that's why they're before you this evening. There's a number of different types. 
um, really foreshadowing the future. We have a total of 25 applications that we're uh, going through. This is the first wave that has kind of uh, passed our review test and met all the requirements. And I should mention that we have a five-person review board that has representation with the clerk's office, fire and codes office, zoning, police department, and then Liam is the quarterback uh, for administration. Uh, of those 25 applications, it might be interesting to know 20 of them, or 80%, are for medical cultivation, just so you're interested. Uh, so we do expect this council will be seeing a number of these applications over the next couple of months, frankly, uh, as we work through the backlog. So thank you for your patience, sir. Thank, thank you. Sir. I happen to be one of the uh, resident, well, summer residents at the corner of Time Point Road and Holly Street. My grandfather built the, hunt, the house in 1925. My wife and I have been owners uh, since 1975, and we love the place. But we're concerned about, well, we listed, a, my family and I listed a number of points that we think we are concerned about. Excessive drain on the town of Scarborough, major power consumption being between the lights used to grow pumps that are watering for fertilizing. Fertilizing a, fertilizers are dangerous even though if they are labeled organic. They hold up over time and can affect the local wildlife, marsh, birds, mollusks, etc. Disposal of waste. Plant material and fertilizers, pesticides, can have adverse effects on the tax and the tax the environment. Increased traffic in that part of town. Native impact on the value of life with the stench involved as the plants grow. This is a great concern. Facilities with young, young children in the area as this is a conflict of interest. It will directly affect property values in that area. And excessive water consumption will prove to be a drain on the town, especially in the time of drought. We're concerned about the, the marshlands which are preserved. The, and the material going from this facility will definitely work back into that marsh and who knows how it's going to be affected. I also have, I would like to give you that list and also a, and a magazine article which shows a lot of the essentials of what is good and what is bad. And it's the environmental downside of cannabis cultivation. And if, with your pleasure, we'll be glad to give it to you. If you have copies, you can bring it right up. We can take them. I, I, I have copies with me. How many do you want? Five, seven? Yep, John, you want to Well, let me see. I think I can get about three. I'll get it. Yeah. And thank you for the opportunity. Sir, can you just give us your name and address? What? We like the place where we are. Yes. And uh, in fact, I love Pine Point, part of Scarborough. I wrote a book about Pine Point back in, uh, oh, I think it was in the 1980s, called The Village of Coquel. And uh, I just love the place, and I don't want to see it go downhill. Hey, do, can we get your name, please? Robert Domain. Perfect. D-O-M-I-N-G-U-E. And your address? 59, well. One, Hall, uh, one Holly Street or 305 Pine Point Road, whichever one you take the taxes <laughs> by. <laughs> and that, but my hometown is Andover, Massachusetts. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Are there any others with us today or online? No? Okay. With that, I'm going to close the public hearing. Order number 20072 is a public hearing and action on request for a catering liquor license from John Bondelio, uh, DBA Bartopia, located at 15 Holly Street, Suite 103. Tody, do you want to let us know what's going on with this? Yes, this is a, uh, an office or a business 
that uh, this is the first time we've had a catering liquor license request. Um, it's giving them permission to serve spirits at wherever they're catering. Since their business is located in Scarborough, they do have to come before this council for approval to move forward. Everything is um, in order, and we recommend that it's approved. Thank you. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. OK. Discussion? Sorry, anything up there? None? It's awfully close to these marijuana cultivating facilities here. Holly Street's all in the same area. <laughs> all right, nothing? Vote, Tony? Councilor Cucci? Yes. Councilor Hayes? Yes. Councilor Katarina? Yes. Councilor Johnson? Yes. Councilor Hamill? Yes. Chairman Johnson? Yes. Thank you. It was unanimous. Thank you. Uh, old business order number 20053 is a second reading on the proposed amendments of. Chapter 405, the Town of Scarborough Zoning Ordinance, Section 9, Performance Standards, sec Subsection P. I think we're going to put this on the table and let Jean Marie speak to it real quick. So is there a motion? So moved. Second. Okay. And Jean Marie, I'm going to call on you first. Um, uh, I have to go back. Is this the rooster one? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I thought this was the other one. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, this is rooster. Yeah. I'm sorry. Jean Marie, okay. I actually, <laughs> you tee it up and then I have a, Don has a public comment for it. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. This this basically will um, um, not allow for roosters to uh, reside in anywhere in Scarborough other than the rural farm district. I guess that's the easiest way to put it. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to let Don speak first because he has an email from a resident that asked that be read right into the record. Yes, uh, resident Jennifer Waters at 48 Winnix Neck Road uh, has requested that we read this into the record. Um, quote, my experience living here has been mostly consistent with the mission of the R2 zone, um, which is to provide residential areas within the town of Scarborough of low density in a matter which will promote a wholesome living environment. My neighbor who keeps chickens for the purpose of gathering their eggs on her 43,560 square foot property acquired two roosters two years ago. The roosters are loud and I can hear them with my window shut. They crow on and off throughout the day as well as early in the morning. The noise impacts myself and my family. I've tried citation through the good neighbor ordinance without much consequence. In fact, using this method of control has resulted in conflict between neighbors because it involves citations from officers, which no one is really comfortable with, neither in initiating the citation or receiving it. In my opinion, code enforcement officers and police officers have more important things to be doing than listening for a rooster in my driveway for 20 to 60 minutes at a time. Animal control officer is not always on duty, especially during early morning hours when the rooster generally crows. And the GNO uh, that references the animal nose noise ordinance, specifically section 604-8, animal noise, addresses only half of the issue, the frequency of which the noise is made, but not the intensity. I believe the burden of proof that a rooster is too boisterous from a noise perspective for most residential zones should not be on the abutter. I fully support order number 20-053 on the proposed amendments to chapter 405 zoning ordinance, which effectively removes roosters um, to from residential zones. I believe it is consistent with creating a wholesome living environment because it still allows those in non-RF zones the ability to keep chickens and collect their eggs provided minimum lot sizes and setbacks are met, yet lets everyday living take priority over farming. It poses no, thre no threat to farming in the recreational sense relating to chicken keeping for the purposes of gathering their eggs. Thank you, Jennifer Waters. Thanks, sir. Are there any, anybody in the audience or online? You go to the mic. Uh, I feel that an acre of land is sufficient to have a rooster and they might not think it's necessary, but it is necessary in farming, and it's a little ridiculous to think the male counterpart to the female isn't part of the circle of life. That's all I got. Can you name an address, please? Nick Messer, 1 Serendipity Lane, Scarborough. Thanks, sir. Any others? Councilor Collins? Councilor Johnson? I just have a question, probably because of a comment that was made in that... Uh, 
email. If this ordinance passes, what happens to folks that already have roosters and they are not in an RF? I'm assuming we don't send out the officers to confiscate the roosters, right? So what is the protocol for this? Is it a replacement rooster? Well, I'm Nick's neighbor, so just bring it by my house and we'll be good. He'll be okay with the roosters. <laughs> yeah, I'm, serious. I'm serious because I... No, it's a, it's a great question. Yeah. I, I yeah. do believe there's, there was an implied expectation in that email. Uh, excellent question, sir. I, I don't really have the answer for you this evening, okay. but I, I will certainly find out. Um, I tend to think you're right. I cannot imagine we will systematically uh, go around town and remove roosters. Uh, but uh, interesting point, something we'll have to work through for sure. And actually, in, in all seriousness, it, it's difficult to get rid of a rooster. You're, you're going to call it, or it gets very difficult to find a place to get rid of it. So you, there will be, my guess is there will be people that are going to be asked to give up their, their livestock with the understanding that it's going to be called or, or killed. Because you're not, Andy's Agway out in, uh, Andy's Agway out in Standish, I think it is, they'll, they'll take live roosters, but it's very difficult to find places that will take a live rooster. So we are gonna put some residents in a, in a spot where they're not gonna quite know what to do, so. Maybe, I, I, I kind of see it as it would be a non-conforming use and an existing non-conforming use can continue as long as you don't expand it. So I don't think they're gonna go around and kill the roosters. Uh, but if somebody wants to put a rooster on land that had previously had one, I suspect they wouldn't be able to do that. You'd be able to complain. Any others? Okay, Tody. Councilor Cucci? Yes. Councilor Hayes? Yes. Councilor Katarina? Yes. Councilor Johnson? Yes. Councilor Hamill? Yes. Chairman Johnson? Yes. Thank you, unanimous. Okay, order number 2062 is act on the request for a five-year uh, five year renewal of the co-op parking lease between the town of Scarborough and 96 King LLC. Uh, Tom? Yes, this matter, uh, we had a public hearing uh, two weeks ago on the matter. Yes. Um, and though there were a number of uh, conditions, if you will, uh, associated with the request for extension, those conditions have been removed. And so what you're being asked to consider is a simple five-year extension of, and all other existing terms and conditions uh, remain intact. So the underlying parking lease, as well as uh, the so-called assumption, assignment assumption and amendment of the parking lease that was negotiated about a year ago, uh, those still remain uh, fully intact and enforceable. I, I will also note there was some question about uh, further public input, though I've not gone to any additional lengths to you know, um, to contact folks and ask their opinion. Uh, uh, at the same time, I've not received any comment uh, for or against this uh, in the meantime. Thank you. Uh, any members of the public, before I bring it to us, any members of the public want to speak? Okay, is there a motion? So moved. Second. Discussion? No? Okay. Tody? Councilor Cucci? Yes. Councilor Hayes? Yes. Councilor Katarina? Yes. Councilor Johnson? Yes. Councilor Hamill? Yes. Chairman Johnson? Yes. Unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. With that, I'm going to take a seven minute break. We will reconvene at 8.15.
you know, there's other seats. You know, all congregating in the corner. Comfortable or comfortable? Yeah. Okay, it is 8.17. I apologize for the delay. I'm going to call this meeting back to order. We are on new business, which is order number 20073. It's an act on the request to renew the town counter, excuse me, town manager's employment agreement. Um, and Don, Mr. Hamill is the chair of appointments and negotiation, and he took the lead on this process. So Don, I will let you um, give the intro. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, we're pleased to have this employment agreement before the council uh, for approval this evening. Uh, I want to thank the town manager, Tom Hall, and uh, Liam Gallagher, who has assisted us through the committee process uh, and uh, as certainly the town council for their work on this new proposed three-year agreement, uh, which would be effective retroactively to July 1st of, of this year, uh, replaces the current agreement, which was due to expire in December. Um, our work together on the, this agreement with Tom over the past few months has accomplished several things which I'd like to draw your attention to. Uh, number one is we've worked hard on trying to improve the alignment of our respective goals and efforts and improve the accountability for performance really, you know, for, for not only the, the town manager but also the, for the town council. Um, Secondly, uh, annual goals, we set annual goals as a council, but we're also gonna be setting annual goals with the manager and we're gonna re reduce those to writing and um, those goals will be used as one component for the, you know, for the performance evaluation. Uh, in the past year, uh, for example, we focused on improving communications um, um, with very good initial progress despite the incredible unseen, unforeseen events and challenges we've had this year with COVID. Uh, and many other things, the budget process and so forth. Third, uh, the, the manager in turn shall collaborate with the town council uh, in the development and accomplishment of the, the town council's annual goals. Um, this is essential for us to execute uh, as a body on behalf of the public for any plans or priorities as we determine necessary you know, as elected representatives. Uh, we can't accomplish anything without Tom and the town staff. Um, in January, uh, working with Tom and the town council, we had several goals set for the town council that included uh, you know, a, a goal not to exceed the 3% increase in the mill rate, which we ex exceeded, you know, uh, uh, achieved with flying colors in a very challenging cycle. Um, we also have been working diligently on growth management ordinance uh, uh, and other items. We've worked uh, extensively this year on workshops and creating more opportunities for the public to get engaged and involved uh, in the public process. Uh, and finally, you know, the objective of the performance evaluation uh, shall be to maintain an optimal working relationship and a mutual understanding and agreement on the duties, responsibilities, and priorities between the manager and the town. Um, and these are excerpts of actual contract language in the EA, so I just wanted to highlight those, and we feel those are uh, actually a win uh, for, for the town and also for Tom. Um, so all in, we think we'll be able to achieve uh, better alignment of goals, results, and rewards. Um, in, in closing, I'd like to say, I think Tom, Tom has been here since November of, nine, of 2008, uh, so you know, well over a decade. Uh, He's built a strong team in that time. He sets high goals for service and performance. Um, you know, he's an individual really who, uh, you know, is, is at the top of his game in terms of uh, his performance as a town manager. He and his team has demonstrated their commitment and dedication again this year by confronting the additional stress and strain of the COVID-19 crisis. So we feel this agreement will help us um, build further continuity in the town leadership and renew our commitment together with the town manager uh, uh, for for improved performance and uh, uh, a good future for the town. So with that, I you know, turn it back to the chair and uh, be happy to field any questions. Thank you, sir. Um, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. And I'll take some discussion. Councilor Katarina. 
Um, yes, uh, I am very happy uh, that we've come to an agreement with Mr. Hall. I'll never forget the first, I don't even know if it was the first day he was at work. Uh, it was the first week, I believe, that my daughter blew up the voting machine. Um, and, and Tom was actually, it's a long story, you don't want to know any more about it. But um, uh, Tom, you know, he, he handled that really well from day one. I've enjoyed working with him both as a citizen and, and in my role as a town counselor. So I was very pleased to see us um, uh, choose to renew his contract and that he is willing to stay. Thank you. If somebody's in the truck, if we can get the, the visual of the dais, that would be good. Uh, Councilor Cucci? Uh, yeah, I'd just like to thank Councilor Hamill for a, a lot of really good work on, uh, you know, combing through the details of this agreement, uh, making sure that it's fair and balanced both, you know, for the town and for the town manager, and uh, congratulate Tom on, you know, a job well done, and uh, I'm excited to keep you on for another three years at least. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any others? None? Okay. Uh, you know, I, I echo what Mr. Colucci said. I think, uh, you know, Don deserves the vast majority of the credit on this. I think that um, this process has been an example of something that's been collaborative and respectful. And having to be in the same room with the three of us over this negotiation, I don't think once did it, did it ever get heated. And I think that we were constructive from start to finish. Um, I think this accomplishes two things, which I think is important to know. It's not just about Tom, it's about the role of the town manager. And I think that this was allowed us as a council to use this as a vehicle to express what we want out of the role of the town manager. Um, and then I think the, the, the piece that goes with that is Tom has stepped forward and he's willing to fulfill that. I, I think there's some things that Tom could have easily said, hey, I'm not willing to do this, and we would have parted ways. So, I think it's important to know, A, I think it's a great job on our end to define the role of the town manager, and kudos to Tom to say, hey, I'm, I'm, I see your definition, and I'm willing to step up to it. So those are my comments. I know it's not appropriate during discussion, but if I could, I'd just like to make a, a couple of comments. Um, you know, as I look back over the last six months or so, uh, I'm in a position now to be a bit reflective. Uh, at the time, it was really crisis-driven, but... Uh, it was an opportunity for me to put in play and show you and show our community the sorts of skills that I've developed over a 30-year career. And certainly I didn't do it alone. I've got a tr tremendous staff. One of the things about longevity being here at 10 years, I've been able to assemble that staff. Um, I inherited a good one, but I've, I've been able through uh, that time to kind of put the team together, so to speak. And so, you know, it's not just me you're hiring. It's, it's the whole package, I, I would say. Uh, and it's remarkable. With the communities I've worked in over the years, uh, it's remarkable what we can get done when we uh, share common views and values and uh, are all rowing in the same direction. So, uh, you know, the future of this community is very bright. Um, I knew that when I came here 10 plus years ago. I've not been disappointed, and I think the next 10 years uh, look even brighter. So thank you for the confidence you've shown in me, and I look forward to working uh, side, side by side with you to advance our community. Thank you. I think I'll give you the last word unless anybody's jumping in. Okay, Tody? Councilor Cucci? Yes. Councilor Hayes? Yes. Councilor Katarina? Yes. Councilor Johnson? Yes. Councilor Hamill? Yes. Chairman Johnson? Yes. It was unanimous. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, order number 20074 is a first reading and schedule a public hearing on the proposed amendments to Chapter 601, the Town of Traffic, excuse me, the Town of Traffic, the Town of Scarborough <laughs> Traffic Ordinance. Uh, Jean Marie, I'm going to just straight up ask for a, um, yep. to put this on the table. Yeah, um, so. I'm going to ask for a motion to table to return to ordinance for further discussion. Um, I just wanted to, well, I think that's all I'm supposed to say, right? Okay, uh, do we have to put it on the table first before we, I think we need Board to table, no? Oh, okay, so motion to table, so, excuse me. Tody? Oh, is there a second? Second. There's Councilor no background Cucci. on that. <laughs> Councilor Cucci? Yes. Councilor Hayes? Yes. Councilor Katarina? Yes. Councilor Johnson? Yes. Councilor Hamill? Yes. Chairman Johnson? Yes. Thank you. That was unanimous. Probably should have. We probably should have intro that a little bit. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's, uh, That's all right. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, order number 20075 is the act on the following request pursuant to Title 23 MRSA 3025 and the requirements of Section 4 of the 
this, the Scarborough Street Acceptance Ordinance to accept LAD Drive, the associated infrastructure, and the open space land in the Heldon Brand subdivision as shown on the plan approved by the Planning Board on September 18th, 2017. I do not see, oh, does Angela want to, she's in the audience, does she want to speak to this? Or do you want to just, I, you choose. She sat here all this time, I suppose. Yeah, give fair her enough. Angela, I'm going to bring in. So she feels her time's worth it. Yeah. Angela? I, I am here. <laughs> you would you like to introduce this matter? <laughs> sure. Um, this is a pretty standard item, so um, I'm just here to answer any questions in case there are any. Um, this is just a, a rural subdivision, 10-lot subdivision off Dresser Road. Um, and we're trying to clean up some of these um, subdivisions that have been lingering a little longer maybe than they should to, to go through this process for street acceptance. Just if I, I'll just add a little bit of context. Uh, when a, in this case, a subdivision comes before planning board, they state their, uh, their expectation that the roads will become public. That in turn invokes uh, a requirement on their part to build to our standards and we have uh, very explicit standards. Uh, and so for folks buying lots in this subdivision, there is uh, you know, a, an expectation that the roads will become public. What Angela is referring to, and she is the one that's um, attending to all the details, is that there are a bunch of small details. It's not just building the road, it's making sure that the monumentation is set and, and the deeds are, are written. And it's those sorts of details that often are, are very difficult uh, to chase down. So. Um, Angela spends more time than she should on these sorts of matters, but they're important to, to get them done. Uh, and in this case, um, everything's in compliance with our uh, street acceptance ordinance. Thank you. Uh, any questions for Angela before there's a motion on the table? John? So will we plow the road before we accept the street? Or is, is there anything substantially different that happens after we accept it than before? Uh, on occasion, we will plow, but uh, we do that under a contract relationship. Uh, we're actually barred from spending public funds on private ways. And so uh, the way around that is to do it through a winter maintenance agreement. We're now out of that business because it became too cumbersome for us, frankly. And it also forced folks to get their work done and get the darn things uh, dedicated to us. So um, rare occasions we'll do that, but, we'll, but that's not what we want to do going forward. Thank you. Councilor Johnson? Yeah, I just want to clarify, which I think I understand what you're saying, Tom, is that's before we accepted it. Yes. Okay, so now we're going to accept it. The town accepts the responsibility of the plowing. And Correct. Any other service we do. Correct. Okay, thank you. There, there often are other issues that affect homeowners, um, not always, but sometimes uh, trash collection is affected when, before it's public. Uh, bus stops, those sorts of things can be issues. And so, again, the expectation of a person buying that lot there could be, and there are years, sometimes decades, that go before this actually occurs. So we're trying our best to get these turned around as quickly as we can. So you will be seeing me more probably in the next few months before the snow flies, um, <laughs> because we have sent out letters for developers to try to get this process completed so that um, we have it formalized before uh, winter operation. Good. Is there, can I get a motion? So moved. Second. Discussion? Todi? Councilor Clucci? Yes. Councilor Hayes? Yes. Councilor Katarina? Yes. Councilor Johnson? Yes. Councilor Hamill? Yes. Chairman Johnson? Yes. Unanimous, thank you. Order number 20076 is a public hearing and scheduled action on September 9th which would be a special meeting, 2020, to initiate offering extended child care as well as to enter into a lease agreement for the property located at 418 Payne Road and Memorandum of Understanding with Crosshold Holdings, LLC, to underwrite this program. I'll give a summary. I'll let Tom flush out my summary. Mm -hmm. And then we will go to the public, and then we'll go to us. Actually, we won't go to us. This is just a public here. Oh, yeah, it's just it a is. public hearing. Excuse me. Um, so my summary is this, is as we all know, the kids in school are going back to physical school twice a week, some, some three days a week or two and a half days, depending on their situation. Uh, that leaves many working families without childcare. 
Um, clearly, we cannot put them in the school because the schools will be occupied at maximum capacities with the given, with the given um, guidelines. So what um, Mr. Souza, who is the head of our community service department, he had approached Tom and um, then Tom floated it to the council where um, the House of Lights, which is located on Payne Road, is approximately 13,000 square feet. And Todd had said, hey, I think I can get 40 kids a day into this and I could get 80 kids on Wednesdays into this facility to offer something very similar to my before and after care, but this would be during school hours for a place to drop off the kids. Um, the fee would be $50 a day, Todd, I believe, is the working fee or the fee. And so we've had two workshops on this, which we've batted around some possible financial outcomes, um, some concerns from counselors, and that leaves us where we are today. Um, for the sake of um, doing this, if we're going to do it, I've requested a special meeting a week from today to finalize this. So today is just a public hearing, but I, I, I'll let Tom report out on some of the updates and maybe enhance what, where we are from our last time we were together, and then I'll go to the public. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, would you be able to share your screen yep. with the file? Yep. Um, since your last public hearing, there was general interest uh, on the part of the majority of council, and with that, uh, we really wanted to kind of uh, move forward to see if we can start to finalize some of the terms and, and details that we've been discussing right along. Um, so with that kind of renewed confidence uh, we were given, we did go out to our uh, community of folks that we we're currently servicing uh, through our before and after care program. And, and I should, uh, you know, make a statement at the outset that, um, you know, we wish we could provide uh, opportunity for everyone in town with kind of equal opportunity and access. We simply don't have the space or the ability to do so. So right, wrong, or indifferent, um, our first look is uh, kind of internal to those that we already have relationships with. And, and that's for a couple of reasons, a uh, lot the least of which uh, we've never been able to meet the existing demand within that community, much less service the larger community. So we did go to that internal community, if you will, uh, with uh, a couple of simple survey questions. Can you bear with me one second? Certainly. Just, I downloaded these ahead of time. We do not have a PDF. So what he's pulling up is the actual survey question. Yep. Okay, there you go. Sorry. Uh, essentially, we laid out uh, the, the basic uh, framework of what we're offering. Essentially, uh, as the chairman introduced, uh, a, a program to help uh, support this hybrid learning model that the school's moving forward with. Uh, we did, for sake of uh, clarity, um, suggest a, a start date of October 8. It might be slightly sooner than that, but we wanted to, in terms of gauging appetite and interest, we wanted to kind of be as specific as we could and so the general question was, you know, would you be interested uh, based on, on that information? Um, the first set of data said uh, 80, 85 uh, respondents were interested and 28 weren't. And so of that group of 85, you'll see the next slide. Um, we asked them to indicate which cohort in terms of Monday, Tuesday or Thursday, Friday that they would be interested in. There's roughly equal numbers, right around 40. And that's the target that we're looking mm -hmm. for. The one area that we're slightly lagging on is the we have capacity and expectation for 80 on Wednesdays, and this shows a total of 66 uh, expressing interest on Wednesday. Um, this gives us uh, a great deal of confidence. Um, uh, Chairman Johnson and myself have been talking. Uh, you know, there's I think there's a fair amount of uh, pent up concern and. and uh, um, just not knowing what, what's next. I think there's others out there that will come forward when they have a sense that this is actually a real thing. It's a bona fide project and even more once it's up and running and people see that it's, it's functioning and, and safe. So we have no concerns that we can meet um, you know, the, the numbers that we've been talking about. Uh, and I think we'll probably find ourselves um, you know, having many more expressing interest than we have capacity for. So yeah, that gives us a, a good deal of confidence to go forward. At the same time, uh, Todd and Liam uh, have really driven this. Uh, they have finalized uh, terms with the. Let me try. I can rotate this. Give me okay. One they have finalized terms on the lease. Uh, it's still in the form of a um, letter of intent. Uh, the last terms that we showed you were terms that we floated to them. They've come back to us and countered in a couple of areas. Costs have gone up slightly, but frankly, the rationale is very sound. They are. They were seeking a three-year lease term. We're looking at 12, 12 months. Um, 
we had asked for a termination provision, which they pushed back on. They said, you know, we're willing to do this, but we really need the assurance that we'll have at least 12 months of revenue. Um, they have given us the ability for um, subleasing or assignment if we find ourselves in that position. And so they, uh, from our perspective, they've been incredibly cooperative and they, I think they see us as a, uh, a model tenant and I think their responses uh, to the terms really suggest their level of interest in this program. Um, so we did use those updated LOI terms uh, and ran the pro forma again. And Sorry, it's, it's different orientation, so yep. it's... And this is presented in the same form as it was last week, uh, essentially a cautious and an optimistic run. Uh, and then the optimistic, we are including adjustments, which we feel confident that we'll actually move forward with. Uh, that's using some full-time staff uh, to help support this uh, in a consistent capacity, and then taking on many of the uh, maintenance responsibilities, plowing, mowing, and, and those sorts of things, and, and janitorial services. Uh, that helps uh, reduce the costs. And so you'll, you'll see kind of uh, the point of this is to show the bookends of, of uh, you know, what might happen given decisions made by others, frankly. If the school chooses to uh, do something differently midstream, uh, we still have a lease to pay. And so we're really trying to bookend what the, uh, the upside and the potential downside is. That downside, I will note, is really backstopped by uh, an underwriter. And uh, Crossroad Holdings, uh, we have an agreement in concept to underwrite us up to $90,000 in losses that we may incur as a result of uh, this endeavor. Uh, I had a conversation this morning with Peter Michu uh, regarding our proposed memo of understanding. And, you know, he has sent it to his lawyer. I've asked him to keep as light a touch on it as possible. I think it's important that it be serve its purpose, but it not be overly complicated either. And so he assured me that what was presented in our proposal uh, is acceptable to him kind of in concept. So uh, there may be some slight changes. I have no doubt that we'll turn that around and have a final draft before you, um, before you consider. So um, I guess the last piece that I don't have uh, anything in uh, a document to present is the school commitment. And I know Todd has met several times with school administration and uh, the, the Board of Education uh, chairwoman as well. Uh, there's no question top to bottom across that organization, they are supportive of what we're doing here. Quite frankly, um, they are still reeling with their own experience, trying to figure out how they're going to do what they need to do to get the doors open safely. And so it's not that they don't care about this, it's just that they have so many other concerns that are straight in front of them, uh, is, is my take on things. Um, so clearly there is, uh, is great and deep support there, and I think they'll, you know, issue a statement of support if we ask them to, if that is helpful. Uh, the, the offer still stands for uh, us using uh, tables and chairs and other equipment on loan, which is a, a great value and help to us. Uh, they will be filing a grant on our behalf, uh, as was mentioned at our last workshop. There are new monies that have been made available for this purpose. They do run through the Department of Education and schools need to be the applicant. So Todd, uh, I know, is uh, finalizing a budget our strategy there, I'll just say, um, knowing, getting a sense of what the, how the allocation is going to work, it will be heavily weighted to, um, and based on the uh, districts receiving a, I think a 35% free and reduced lunch um, program. And Todd, forgive me, what is our current percentage? We're, We're just under 13%. So mm. we expect that, uh, you know, We'll have a hard time competing. In fact, uh, we'll be looking for leftovers uh, and, and be happy with that. So our approach is going to be uh, putting in things that I would call as more supplemental, uh, that we're not relying to, to operate this um, operation with, such as uh, nutrition, you know, snacks for the kids. Uh, at this point, they'll be bringing their own. Uh, there's some additional janitorial and cleaning that we would be seeking. Um, and uh, I... I so our, our sense is the likelihood of award is fairly slim, but I think our strategy of being kind of uh, realistic in our ask is going to be helpful to our cause. And I guess the final piece is they've agreed to, the Board of Education has agreed to hold a finance committee meeting 
uh, for purposes of discussing uh, possible financial, direct financial support. And I really can't speculate as to what, if anything, will come from that, other than the fact that I think their willingness to talk about it uh, demonstrates some level of support in and of itself. So I think we have a, a partner there. I just think they're a bit preoccupied uh, with what, what they need to do to open schools uh, at this point. So I guess in a nutshell, and, and Liam and Todd are far closer to the details and certainly available to the council if you wish, uh, we're certainly, uh, our, our hopes are buoyed uh, and we're more confident than we've been in the past uh, that we can actually accomplish this. And uh, interested to get public comment from the community and have the council consider this formally next week. Does anyone have any questions for Todd before I open it? To, I'm sorry, uh, Tom, before I open it to the public. Don, did you have a question? Yeah, and I just had uh, yep. one question. Uh, uh, Tom, you touched on this a little bit mm -hmm. with the, uh, the reference to free and re reduced lunch percentages, but have you have uh, you and Todd and Liam kind of thought through the how to how to offer this? Uh, last I heard, the the assumption was we would offer this to folks that are currently participating in the before and after care. So, uh, you know, I will, what process will you use, and will there be any uh, opportunity to do need based? Uh, now, at this point, we are focusing on that community uh, of families that we have uh, relations with currently. So, uh, though I think a need-based program would be wonderful, we just aren't in a position to be able to offer it um, based on that. Uh, you know, the, the free and reduced lunch, because these funds will be coming through DOE and the actual recipient will likely be Scarborough School District, uh, they're using that uh, free and reduced lunch percentage as probably a cutoff, as a way to kind of make the grade. Uh, again, uh, my expectation is if there's money left over, that's what we'll be uh, have some access to. And if our ask is fair and reasonable, uh, you know, our, I think our chances are better than not. So, um, Todd, it might be helpful if you just take the mic. Uh, I, timing is everything. Um, I know we have to make application very soon, and importantly, we'll know very soon as well. Yeah. Yeah, so applications are due on Friday by 5 o'clock. Uh, they review the applications uh, 8th through the 10th, and we should hear on the 11th. So it's a quick turnaround regarding what that is, and I think it fits into our timeline as quickly and as best it possibly can, uh, trying to get to next week. And then uh, if approved next week, um, looking to order and allocate the things that we need to do. So we'll kind of know, is that funding in the wheelhouse, or are we going with initial plans? Um, and... Uh, working off that grant fund if it's available. Councillor, uh, Ken, did you have a question for Todd or? Actually, Ken and then, and then John. Yeah, the question for Tom, mm -hmm. I think, in a minute, Todd. Just for clarification, uh, my understanding was the liais town council liaison was to reach out to the BOE, but I heard you say you had. So w w were there two reach outs or? Did one not happen, or do we have an update from the... Oh, I'm sorry, the liaison is not here. All right. Second, uh, just point of clarification. I noticed that the worst-case scenario with the underwriting was now s looked like about 75000 versus 55. Is that because of the difference in the lease going from a 9-month max to a 12-month max? So the lease that they came... If you want me to, Tom. Please. Um, the least they came back with is about a $3,100 increase. They just did some square footage adjustment on the uh, 4,100 square feet of the warehouse just because of uh, the, co the competition in that market. Um, what, again, and Liam brought it forward last week, when you look at that um, cautious model there, there is about that $32,000 that's not transferring over to the um, cautious with my staff adjustments that it would that'll happen either way with staffing costs so that overall risk of uh excuse me 164 comes down by 32 and the 90 so um that's not reflected there so okay uh, i'm sorry maybe it was the way i asked the question my memory was that within the lease we had a possible escape clause that our overall exposure was nine months at the max right and so that, that's with yeah. a 30-day notice yeah 
And one of the terms that they came back with was that they, they wanted a 12, they wanted to remove that and okay. come back with a 12 month clause just because of their goal was a three year lease. Right. Okay. Yep. All right. Just wanted to, mm -hmm. you know, close yep. the gap in understanding. Sure. And Sorry. then, Sorry. and then the other one, the, I, I know you just mentioned Tom that, uh, uh, MNR went brought the memorandum to their attorney. I mean, is there any danger in this not going through? I don't think so. Again, I spoke directly to Peter Richard this morning. Yeah. Uh, he said you can represent on my behalf that uh, what's uh, you know written in, in okay. before you is uh, I'm in agreement in concept. I think he wants to be careful and have his attorney take a look at it. So you think maybe by September 9th on the action yes. night that we'll have that answer? I would not ask you to vote on something that's not okay. final. So right. I certainly would. All right. Thank you. John, can I just follow up on his question? Just, Todd, why, why, why didn't you put the thirty-two thousand in the worst-case scenario? If you're, do you know what I'm saying? Why, why are we just verbally saying that? Oh, it's actually thirty-two thousand dollars less. Why isn't it in the modeled in the worst-case scenario? Or is it? Am I not missing the boat? So, so initially, when we first started doing this, depending on what we get for grant funding and, and other parts of it, yeah. is that the cautious model is us using part-time staff. And so right now I have the ability to say, I can use my full-time staff to offset some of the stuff. But as we get back into the world of things, some of those things may shrink up a little bit and I okay. may have to say, I need to go back to that part-time staff at X dollars and get my staff back in their lane. So um, for right now and in that foreseeable future, we should be pretty comfortable in that role. Okay. Yeah, John, I, oh, follow sorry, up on ahead. that. John was first, right? Unless it's a direct follow up. Uh, it is actually. Yeah, then directly follow it up. Sorry, sorry to yeah. jump in front here, but uh, could you, to that point on headcount, could, and I'm sorry to task you with anything else here because I know you guys are turning yourselves inside out to, to get this thing uh, through through the shoot, but could you give us an underlying uh, or a backup staffing plan, you know, as part of this so we kind of know what. I mean, is it, you referenced the part-timers and yeah, some shipping sure. around. So but the, when I talk about the 40 students on a day-to-day -day cohort, cohort, excuse me, we're talking about 10 kids. And our model is we're going to be available to these students from 7 in the morning until 6 at night, just like we do during care. And so the plan and the cautious is to run two overlapping part-time person people so we don't get into the benefit time frame of a one will work 30 hours a week and one will work 25. Where I'm going to implement my staff is I have two full-time childcare people that I'm going to commit to this program mm -hmm. and have the supervisor oversee the existing before and after care. And then I have three other full-time people that have other roles, scheduling, seniors, some sports stuff, that they have some capacity right now to each take a five-hour shift one day a week. That reduces by 25 hours. And so it's a so shared could, commitment. Sorry, no, don't mean to interrupt, but could you just put that in the legend so we have a note to reference so when sure. we're looking at it, so it yep. will can be helpful. I, can I go a step further? And yeah. Can you just, assuming you have a little spreadsheet whipped up or some visual, can you send us the visual? It's just hard listening to you and understanding. Yeah. Sure. It's a lot yeah. of moving parts for yeah, us. Yeah, so what I'll do is, I mean, if that's, if, if you know, I'll create this as, this is the... I yeah. think what they're asking for is really the backup. I mean, what this yes. form yeah. has yeah. all those numbers rolled up. There's yep. details yep. associated yep. with each yep. of these lines. Like, I just want to see that five-hour overlap you're speaking of. I just want to see how the day looks. I think it would be easier for us to understand it. Absolutely. So, yep. Okay, John, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's yeah. Sorry, that's okay. Um, so my question is kind of along the same lines. When I look at the pro forma, it looks like this thing's expected to generate a profit for the town. So my question is, it, should you receive grant funding, what will you do with it? And uh, would you reduce the pricing? And then also with the, uh, the cross cr crossroads commitment, why are we looking to generate a profit for the program if we have somebody willing to underwrite a loss, I guess? It's so initially, uh, you know, when we're talking about the fee, um, one is more to try to protect ourselves in the sense of trying to close that gap. We've got the crossroad money. And if something happens, we, we're pretty confident that the school is going to stay in this model through December. So we have this opportunity to make this gap a revenue. The second pat January to June, which is 24 weeks long and a majority of the full budget, um, is the unknown right now. And so um, at that time, we'll still be using the same group of people. So if there's a choice that we do something, whether we receive grant funding, the grant funding is to try to mitigate some of these things where, like Tom said, presently, students come to this program, we have to bring snacks and their own lunches. And so part of that fund would be able to um, uh, provide snacks through the school system. Part of that is increased cleanings, um, to, you know, instead of having uh, 
somebody coming in part time if we can get somebody in the building 30 hours a week to take care of that um, the grant will be looking at trying to do increase some technology to increase the experience there all things that we can take with us right now today we spent a couple hours uh, with Todd Jepson and his staff looking at what they have for tables and chairs and it's a real smorgasbord as far as how what we have and so part of this grant ask would be um, to try to purchase some appropriate size things to fill some of those gaps and so that's where I'm going after the grant instead of having a uh, fifth grader in a 13 inch chair and they're supposed to be in a 15 inch chair we'll go buy some 15 inch chairs if we get this grant if not we'll make it work so that's what we're trying to do is, is scab stuff together to make the experience better with the grant I guess the other point is I, I though we may be able to charge less and maybe ch charge nothing that doesn't feel right we're already um, dealing with a very small subset of our community and then if we add on top of that um, the fact that it's free I think that just makes that situation even more egregious potentially so I don't see us reducing the fee much at all and certainly not eliminating it um, the grant funds would really be used to supplement um, the, the the program kind of enrich it to, to some extent okay. thank you any more clarifying questions before we go to the yes public? yep yeah yep. Uh, um, very quickly talking about lunches made me wonder I know uh, when the schools shut down they made school lunches available to kids you know regardless uh, through the school lunch program and has anyone investigated when these kids are you know on these um, fur furlough what not furlough days whatever they're calling them um, that um, school lunches are available because I know they drop off school lunches at eight corners and eight corners is just around the corner from this building so uh, I'm just trying to think out of the box here. yeah no I can look into that I do not have that answer at this time I can okay. I can confirm that for you any more <clears throat> okay we have a couple members of the public anybody come on down None? Okay, with that, we will see everybody on September 9th. I, I should mention uh, that evening there is a zoning board meeting at 6. So uh, I would suggest that we meet at 5 if the council thinks that you're able to work through this single item agenda in an hour's time. That should be sufficient. Is that acceptable? Yeah. Yep, okay. and I guess this is a good time to mention, I, have, I believe I floated to Ken and Don also considering putting Jocelyn place on that to, to remove that off our pipeline, but I will, I will take the temperature of the council offline and if there's temperature to do it, we could knock out Jocelyn place and this in the same meeting to put them behind us. So again, we have an hour. It's but we only have an hour, so something uh, to consider. Can, uh, Mr. Chair, could we just go totally online? That, that's another yeah. consideration we could do this one remote since we've done yeah. the public hearing process Let, let's do this Don and I are meeting with uh, Tom and Liam tomorrow for two hours so I'll report out to you guys over email in my chair's report and we'll just reply to me individually and I'll take the consensus how's that sound okay all right uh, item number eight is the non-action items uh, I've been combining item 9 and 11 but since we're kind of back in the swing of things I'm not going to um, so Brevity is good if you want to, but item number nine is standing in special committee reports and liaison reports. Is there anybody that needs to report out any of those? Council, uh, Councilor Hayes and then Councilor Katarina. Yeah, I think just, just a quick one. Um, I have not been able to get in touch with Betsy, but I think it does work with, with John, but the finance committee is gonna have a singular item um, to kind of finalize, hopefully, and get on the table the, the sort of final TIF and CEA policy. The meeting will be 9.15 at 4 o'clock for anybody that's interested in, in listening in or, or following that process. And the hope will be I, it may be able to go on the agenda on the 16th. I think it depends on, you know, there's Tom's got a lot of balls in the air, so some of it is, is just, you know, will will it be able to be done by that time period so i just wanted to give a heads up yep good thank you uh council katarina you have an update for liaisons or committees uh yeah just real quickly uh just a reminder of the public that the ordinance uh committee will be meeting on uh, uh excuse me the 17th at four o'clock and our basic agenda item is going to be 5g um so i just want to remind people of that also let people know that the Legislative Policy Committee, that's the legis, um, oh, I can't even talk anymore, 
of Maine Municipal Association. We are beginning our meetings, <clears throat> excuse me, September 24th uh, to try to get ahead of the legislative session because as everyone knows, it's gonna be tough fiscal year. So um, we wanna start working with the legislature now. So I just wanna update people on that. Thank you, that's helpful. Anybody else? Council Clucci. Um, I just want to give an update. Uh, since Betsy's not here, rules and policy is expected to meet on Thursday, September 10th at 4. And we will be discussing um, a charter committee or the process, the recommendation, one of our goals for the year, actually, and, uh, and possibly ha scheduling a, a town council workshop to discuss it. Just on that point, I, I did have the time uh, yesterday to work through much of that, and I've provided it to, uh, to Councillor Gleistein as chair. And I suspect that will be shared with committee members shortly, but I want to get her input first. So I think that, that meeting you'll be well positioned to at least have something to talk about, if not move on. Council Hamill? Uh, just a quick uh, note that uh, we'll be back on track with a monthly appointments and negotiations committee meeting on Tuesday, September 8th. So we should have the agenda out tomorrow. Sorry, we're a little bit late on that. Okay, great. Um, item number 11 is councilor comments. So uh, let's just go around the table. <laughs> Mr. Clucci? <laughs> I've got nothing to add. It's okay. good to be back in chambers. Right. Uh, councilor Katarina? Um, not, not much, just, you know, I'm very happy to see us uh, continuing to move forward with uh, helping the public, particularly uh, I hope to heck we pass this child care uh, program because I do think it's an essential service we could be offering um, to the parents of this town. Um, and again, uh, I want to thank Mr. Hall for all of his years of service to us so far. And I look forward to working with him down the line. Thanks. Thank Councilor Hayes? Yeah, nothing this evening. Thank you. Yep. Councilor Johnson? As Mark Twain once said, I have nothing. Thank you. <laughs> Did he say that? Councilor Hamill? <laughs> no, not, nothing to add. <laughs> After that. I have one quick thing to add. If anybody out there watch, listening or watching, uh, just a reminder, um, I was contacted by the executive director of GPCOG, um, who's Christina Egan. The governor, I think it's $25 million in, in business relief funds for COVID, and uh -huh. GPCOG is a... They're actually, I believe, the body that is actually going to determine whether um, who gets the funds. Nice. And the deadline, I believe, is September 9th. My guess is it's not. It, that's that's some good free money out there. So if you're a business owner in Scarborough, go get it. Uh, if you need more details, I'm sure Karen Martin at yes. Sedco would totally help you um, with the process. But $25 million coming late in the game when everybody's already had their PPP loan and all that good stuff, usually that's an opportunity for a small business owner to, to scoop up some of that action. So get out there and get some money. Yeah, and yeah Paul, um, Paul, if I could just add to that, I happen to know that it's, it's undersought at the moment. See, so my prediction was correct. Wow. Yeah, bring that up. I'm going to do, you know what? I'm going to fill out my application tonight. <laughs> and, and I believe they, they, <laughs> these are direct grants, and I think uh, there's a, a maximum of $100,000. So it's, mm. it's certainly something to look at. And Karen Martin uh, is well versed and, and will certainly be pleased to help. Awesome. So, with that, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Thank you. Tody? Yes. I think he hurt you. I can't hear you. Sorry. Councillor Hayes? Peter? I think his mic went off. I think his. Councillor Katarina? Yes. Councillor Hamill? Yes. Councillor Johnson? Yes. Chairman Johnson? Yes. Okay. Good, good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Yeah, yes. that was, uh, nice. Congratulations. Yes, I was going to yeah. say, this is yeah. usually where it is. Yeah, thanks for